Good morning and welcome to the 2021 CEP ERTMS workshop by colleagues from INEA, the European Commission, as well as stakeholders involved in ERTMS project implementation. We'll discuss the challenges faced during the implementation of CEP supported projects. Um, you have the agenda on, on the screen. Uh, what we will cover today is uh, a welcome and introduction to INEA, to CEF, and more precisely also to ERTMS in CEF. Then we will cover the policy context around ERTMS in the EU. We will have some feedback of experiences from beneficiaries with the implementation of the ERTMS projects. And then we will also have some information about the EU technical support to projects offered by uh, ERA and DMT. If you have any questions, which we certainly hope you will have, uh, please submit them via Slido using the hashtag uh, ERTMS workshop. And we will answer them during the two specific Q&A sessions that are foreseen uh, in the agenda. Uh, the event will last until 1300, so until one o'clock. Uh, it will be in English only, so we will have no interpretation available. Um, if you have a specific uh, a question for a specific speaker, then please, when you ask the question using Slido, uh, use app and the name of the speaker. That will help us to directly uh, give the, uh, the question to the, to the speaker to whom you want to direct the question. Um, the presentations will be available on, uh, on the agency website on the event page uh, afterwards and the, the event is recorded and the recording of the event will be available also on the, on the same website uh, for two years. And with these words of uh, practicalities, uh, I would like to give the word to Andreas Boschen for a welcome to INEA. Andreas, the word is yours. Thank you, Morten, and uh, good morning uh, from my side. Uh, I'm the head of the CEF department, the Connecting Europe facility the department in the agency, and uh, it's good to be back with you on an ERTMS workshop uh, because I think we really need to discuss uh, uh, some important things. Uh, let me send a special welcome to Matthias Rüte, the European coordinator for ERTMS. We are glad to have you with us, and you will take the floor uh, later. Uh, many thanks to all uh, speakers and organizers, Morten and the team, as, uh, but also their colleagues from MOVE, colleagues from ERA, DMT, INECO, who will take the floor. And I also would like to uh, really appreciate that we will have three beneficiaries, if my, if my counting is correct, who will make real cases about their implementation experience, the good things and the bad things. So that looks like a promising and, and active and full uh, morning workshop. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, by the way, I, I just liked on Twitter our, our account, and I also tried to go to Slido to see what questions are coming in. So uh, you know that we are in the COVID mode, so we have to be interactive, and we have to uh, work in this virtual way. So please use Slido and Twitter. Can we go one slide further already, please? And another one, I hope at least. Oh, that was the other. That's the right direction. So uh, the welcome from my side. What we try to do is here to share knowledge and experience on the implementation of our actions uh, covering ERTMS. Uh, let me say infrastructure projects are difficult by nature. I would say rail projects are really difficult by nature and then maybe ERTMS are the very difficult uh, projects by nature and, and you will see some telling figures uh, later. Um, uh, that we have made progress, that's very good, but we have not made as much progress as we wanted and there are reasons for it. COVID is not helping us at all. Nobody, not us as an agency, as an organization, not you as a beneficiary, not us as human beings, not society. So actually we are extending many of the actions, including the ERTM action, ERTMS actions by two or even three years to allow them to, to complete. This is a good project 
project management, but is of course not ideal in terms of ERTMS rollout. So for CEF1, uh, we are through because we have just had the final cutoff date under the blending call where ERTMS projects uh, had uh, a chance to apply. And indeed, we are lucky to see that some have applied again. Very good. So now it's also time to learn the lessons and let's do uh, better in the future. So we will have feedback from the actions, feedback from the different uh, parties involved. I hope I didn't forget ERA when I said many thanks to all speakers because ERA will also is of course an in, a full part of our ERTMS uh, family and we would like to help you beneficiaries to come to a successful completion of your actions which is then at the same time for us the best use of our EU money. Can I have the next slide? I will just give you a bit of big context before we zoom into the ERTMS reality. You know that the budget for EU infrastructure support, the Connecting Europe facility, is a huge budget over the uh, previous financial period. We are almost looking at 29 billion euro, which we are managing in, the, in our agency. Transport is by far getting the biggest share because transport infrastructure is really expensive, as you can see. Next slide, please. And our transport portfolio is very much a rail portfolio, rail with all the different elements. It is the Brenner Base Tunnel, it's the Lyon Turin, it is the Fehmann, it is Rail Baltica. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but it is, of course, also a lot of ERTMS and uh, Morton will give you more details. It is also rail interoperability, rail freight corridors, uh, um, uh, silent brakes for freight wagons and so on. So we are very much a rail uh, driven uh, portfolio. And let me also tell you that the 20, roughly 23 billion of investment uh, from our side will trigger a total investment of 50 billion euros. So that's really an important figure. We are modernizing uh, EU transport infrastructure in all uh, countries. Next slide, please. And that's a bit the future. Uh, you are aware that we are changing. We have a new multi-annual financial framework with big decisions taken, recovery, resilience, uh, more research, digitalization, European Green Deal. And we are changing as an agency, as an organization. So it's the last time probably we will talk to you as INEA because as from 1st of April, we will be CINEA. We will add the the C for climate because we will become the European Climate Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency with a lot more responsibilities and with a coherent portfolio of the European Green Deal implementation. That you can see on the next slide, please. <clears throat> That's the new uh, um, areas we are managing. Uh, so there are some uh, areas which you know, if I start clockwise uh, uh, on the right top, the Connecting Europe facility will stay with us for transport and energy. We will continue with research, but in a, in a larger extent, because we will have the full cluster climate, energy and mobility. We will continue with the Innovation Fund, which is again something about climate change. And we get new kids on the blocks. We are taking over the life program. We are doing just transition mechanism, which is again linked to climate change, renewable energy energy, again, you see the European Green Deal is there, and then let's say the maritime, the blue economy. So that's a coherent portfolio for us in the agency as a, as a new European climate infrastructure and environment executive agency. And for me as a manager, it's very important to have the message transport is part of the European Green Deal. We are not dirty, we are not old-fashioned, and in particular ERTMS, this is about more capacity, uh, about a more efficiency, and this is a big contribution to the European Green Deal. Can I have the next slide, please? And that is the good transition, hopefully, also to the special year in which we are in. We are in the European year of rail, which is uh, an important moment to take stock of this important transport mode and to promote it, uh, to promote the use of trains as a safe and sustainable transport mode, both for passengers and for freight. We need modal shift to, to get the Green Deal done, uh, both from uh, short-term um, short flights uh, uh, and also 
also from trucks uh, to uh, to rail freight and uh, we would also invite you all as stakeholders who are somehow linked to the EU rail family to make good use and to promote the European year of rail it might not be the year where we will all travel a lot in the rail at least not in the first half of the year unfortunately but we should set the scene prepare the scene when when normality comes back that many people will like to hop on as it is said here on the train and we would invite you uh, to continue we will certainly do many other actions on the european year of rail to show our contribution and i think i can stop here i hope i have respected my time frame and i hope it was an interesting overview i will stay listening to you and i hand now back over to morton for zooming in more into ertms have a very good workshop thank you Thank you very much, Andreas. Thank you for the welcome and, and the, the overview of the connecting facility and also an outlook to where we are moving in, in, in the future. So um, what I will do is I will uh, dig a little bit into uh, uh, ERTMS and what we did in CEF1. And when I talk about CEF1, I talk about the period, the, the, the uh, multi, uh, the financial uh, period from 2014 to 2020. So the projects that are currently ongoing under the Connecting Europe facility uh, regarding ERTMS. So in that period, we've had seven dedicated CEF calls um, for ERTMS. And, and in there, we have been focusing on, in particular, on, on onboard and trackside uh, projects. And we have been focusing on uh, baseline three. Uh, in addition to these uh, specific projects uh, addressing either onboard or trackside, we have also had some projects that have combined infrastructure works uh, with implementation of trackside ERTMS at, at the end. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what did we actually do in, in, in this period? Uh, what was the outcome of, of the, uh, these calls for proposals? Um, so in terms of, of trackside, we've had 29 actions um, and uh, Currently, we have 26 of them. Uh, with regard to onboard, we have uh, 39 actions uh, selected, and for the moment, there are 31 ongoing. Uh, then we have had two uh, uh, ERTMS projects addressing uh, MOU, so addressing uh, things that are uh, general to ERTMS uh, for, for the implementation of ERTMS in a broader context. So uh, in, in this overview, what you see, uh, we have excluded the combined uh, actions. So the actions that are, are combining uh, infrastructure implementation with uh, ERTMS track side. It, it, it is a limited number of actions and, and we are focusing on, on the, the actions that are dedicated to, uh, to ERTMS. Um, as you will see, uh, also from this slide, uh, when it comes to track side, we uh, on the initial uh, status compared to the actual status of what is actually being implemented, uh, then you will in particular see that there is quite a significant reduction on, on the number of onboard units uh, compared to what was initially selected. I will get into this in the next slide. So here we are focusing on, on the evolution of the portfolio of, of uh, ERTMS onboard projects and, and also the type of uh, projects that, uh, that have been supported. Um, so you will see that initially we had selected uh, 210 different prototypes to be developed. Currently we are at 158. Uh, obviously this also has led to a reduction in number of retrofit uh, following the development of these uh, prototypes. And there we also have a, a significant reduction. Secondly, we have uh, the upgrade of, of ERTMS, uh, where we also see a reduction. And the last type of, of projects that we have been supporting on the onboard side is, is fitment. Uh, there you don't see a reduction, uh, but this is uh, namely because these projects have been selected very recently and are only about to start now. Uh, so we hope that uh, we will be able to see uh, ideally a full uh, implementation of these actions, but at least not a, a similar reduction to, uh, to the fitment compared to the other projects. So um, 
as you have seen from from these figures, we have we have seen a um, significant reduction of what was actually selected for funding and what is currently expected to be implemented in terms of funding, and and therefore we we are also organizing this workshop workshop to address these issues and with a view to to maximize the use of the funding. So for the moment we are we are at the end of the 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 current financial framework. We are actually after the end of it because it it officially ended uh, 2020 um, but the projects are are continuing for several years it also means that the adjustments that we have we have made for projects that were selected in the early years of the program uh, and where due to different uh, problems were reduced in their scope um, and where we have been able to let's say also take back some of the funding and reuse it again this is no longer possible. Uh, so therefore, it's very important that what we have now in our portfolio will also be implemented as much as possible. Um, if we look at, at what has been, uh, let's, we, we, we say absorbed out of the portfolio, then uh, what was selected and what we currently have in, in the um, uh, in the portfolio then makes something around 72% of, of the initial EU financing that was made available to these projects. And this is, of course, uh, there, there are many good reasons for, for not being closer to 100%. Uh, but what is very important is, of course, that we now will be able to absorb almost all that is available uh, left in the projects now. But there's also another dimension which is very important because uh, as, as Andreas also showed to you, then the, the budget for the CEF is spent on to a very large degree on rail, but it's also spent on, on other uh, modes of transport. And of course, the budget is limited and there is a high demand for the budget. So therefore, also ERTMS somehow is competing for getting budget out of, out of the total uh, ERTMS budget. And therefore, when our colleagues in, in DG Move and, and, and also when Matthias Rüte uh, are making the case for the um, for for getting funding for ERTMS, it is of course important that they can also show that that we are actually spending the money that that is made available to ERTMS. So therefore, again, to underline the importance of implementing the projects as planned. Next slide, please. Um, just, a, just a very quick reminder of, about uh, the payment rules for the CEF projects. Um, I will not go into the details of all of them, but, but of course the, the ERTMS is only useful once it's all authorized and, and, and used in, in practice. And therefore we are also requiring uh, that, uh, that this is happening in, in order to pay the CEF funding. Uh, and, and this is what we need in, in order to be able to give you the set funding that, that has been allocated to you. And there, there we are using different mechanisms also to support you in this process. Uh, next slide, please. So when we are looking back to uh, the projects that have been selected from the 2014 call for proposals uh, and, and until today, well, then, especially in, in the first years, uh, the project selected in 14, 15, uh, 16, we have seen uh, uh, problems or issues related to baseline three products. On the one hand, to uh, non-availability of, of baseline three in the early years, uh, also high costs uh, related to, uh, to baseline three. We've seen that there have been changes to national implementation plans which has also delayed the rollout of ERTMS, uh, not only on trackside, but subsequently also on, on, on the onboard units. Um, another problem that, that we have seen from, from the projects or heard from the projects is uh, the non-availability of, of ERTMS equipped uh, uh, facilities for, for testing, both for onboard and trackside. We have seen limited capacity of suppliers to deliver, which, which links back to, to baseline three also. Um, we have also seen difficulties in uh, being, being successful in procuring the, um, uh, the ERTMS either track side or on board. So difficulties in procurement, uh, difficulties in, in, in preparing uh, 
specifications for call for tenders that are giving a good response and also giving good prices. Uh, this has also been, been challenges that we have heard from, from projects. Um, then, uh, of course, we also see that trackside projects are suffering from delays in the implementation of, of the rail infrastructure itself, so on the, on, on the implementation of, of projects, uh, making the track better and, and so on. Uh, and, and this leads to, to delays for the implementation of trackside ERTMS. Um, also, as, as you saw from, from one of my previous slides, for onboard projects, we've also seen delays in, in prototype development and prototype uh, approval, and that is then hampering the serial implementation uh, or serial deployment following the development of the prototype. So these are some of the challenges that, that, that we have seen from the discussions with the projects and, and where we um, uh, have had to adjust the, the grant agreements that we are having. Uh, to take into account these uh, these challenges. Next slide, please. But it's 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 not on, only bad. Of course, there are also many many good things. And 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 uh, even if we we very often talk about the difficulties and the challenges, of course there are there is very good progress being made, and we should of of course also not forget that. What what we have seen uh, in particular uh, when projects are running more smoothly in their implementation is that when they have been submitted to a, uh, to a call for proposals, they have been mature, they have been ready to start uh, immediately uh, once they have been selected for funding, and and this has made quite a difference in the um, in in the implementation of in the timely implementation of these projects, both in terms of scope and, and in time. We have also seen that uh, that a close cooperation between the different actors is very important. And, and also from, from, the, from the outset of the implementation of the projects. So a good cooperation with the suppliers, with ERA, with the NSAs and, and with the NOBOs are, are also important success factors for, for, our, for a timely and, and full implementation of the, of the projects. And in that context, there is also the use of the uh, expertise that is being offered through the deployment management team. Uh, and, and we will get back to that later on also. But these are all things that are, have, have a positive impact on the implementation of the projects. Next slide, please. So when we are looking uh, also ahead towards CEF2, which is going to start this year, um, well, then the first very important thing, and also indicated by Andreas, ERTMS remains one of the key priorities. It is a very important area for uh, for improving the, the, the use of the uh, capacity that is already existing. It's also an important element of digitalization of, of transport. Uh, so it is also one of the key priorities on the CEF2. In CEF2, we will, we will continue uh, using unit contribution uh, as we have done at, at the very end of, of uh, CEF1. Uh, this uh, is, uh, let's say, this, this is uh, reducing the administrative burden uh, on, on the side of, of the beneficiaries, first of all, uh, but also on, on our side, of course. So, so this is something that will continue we will still uh, need the de technical deliverables as proof of, of completion of these uh, uh, of, of the actions that will be selected on the CEF2. Um, as, as I said, we one of the success factors that we have identified and also feedback we received from 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 many of you relates to uh, the fact that uh, there has not been a, a good visibility of the funding opportunities in CEF1. So when will ERTMS be open in, in, in a call for proposals on the CEF? Uh, and, and that has led to the submission of applications uh, that were not as mature as they ideally should have been. Uh, and this is to, to some extent due to the fact that there was it was not known when the next call would be. So, so it has been seen as better to submit an, an, an application uh, a, a bit too early uh, rather than, than missing the, the potential opportunity. The good thing with CEF2 is that 
there will be a planning, of course, uh, for the first three years, uh, a fixed planning and, and an in indicative outlook also for, for further years. So this will give uh, potential applicants a visibility of when are, uh, when are the calls for proposals for ERTMS and also other areas open for, for submission of proposals. So when uh, can I submit my proposal? And this we hope and, and expect that this will also lead to more mature proposals being submitted uh, because now you know that uh, there's not only a call in 2021, there's one in 2022, there's one in 2023. So therefore you can you can prepare your application for when your project is actually ready to start. And, and this, we believe, will also help to improve the, uh, the, the, the full completion of the, uh, of the pro projects that are selected for funding on the SEP. Um, and, and this is a little bit from my side, so uh, an overview of what has happened in SEF with an uh, outlook to SEF 2. And, and with these words, uh, I would like to, to move on to the next item on, on the agenda and, and where we will uh, ask our colleagues and, and uh, Matthias Rüte as the European coordinator for ERTMS to give us uh, an, an insight into the, the policy context as it is for the moment. Matthias, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morten. And uh, thank you very much, Andreas, also for organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, I still remember that uh, uh, together with Karl Wink, I was still in the commission at the time. I participated in the seminar in November uh, 2018, and uh, I was impressed by all the questions uh, that were being asked and the answers uh, we were trying to give at that time. And I do hope to learn also from this seminar uh, again uh, for my work. Uh, in the meantime, I've been as a coordinator working with uh, most stakeholders. I think I had something like 200 meetings altogether. And um, I have also come out with uh, a first work program in June last year, which uh, I can say without blushing because a lot of others contributed uh, to that work program, that it is actually quite a comprehensive description of the situation of ERTMS uh, in Europe. Let me, before I give you my major messages, um, first of all, perhaps give uh, a bigger take in terms of uh, where we stand. Um, I am personally very much convinced, and this is not only because I'm a TMS coordinator, that we are playing the future of rail in the transport system. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, freight is at the moment around something like 19% in terms of average of the European Union uh, in rail and uh, in terms of modal share and we are around 8% uh, for passengers. Um, we are at the moment obviously decarbonizing uh, the other modes of transport. Uh, rail has already done its bit on, uh, on that. Uh, but if we don't make sure that the modal share of rail is increased, uh, we will in the end uh, have more electric trucks uh, the same congestion, more electric cars uh, on the roads, uh, and uh, we will not be participating as the rail community in this major transformation of the European transport system. And we need ERTMS in order to be able to participate. Morton, you've already said that uh, uh, ERTMS, to a certain extent, is a backbone of uh, digitalization, and I do not believe that we will have a serious digitalization of rail without ERTMS. And so that is uh, one of the factors which is also very important for us to think about a much more rapid rollout of ERTMS. Um, in terms of rapid rollout of ERTMS, Martin Wojcik will uh, in a minute give you uh, a number of uh, uh, figures. Morten, you have already given uh, some of the figures in terms of the CEF calls. Um, Yes, we have uh, a certain delay in as much as the implementation of the European Deployment Plan is concerned, but I'm still relatively optimistic that by 2030 uh, we will be near uh, the ambitions that we have set ourselves in terms of ERTMS rollout. And let me say in this context the following. In the past, 
very often we discussed ERTMS as an additional system which was uh, put on top of the existing systems, uh, whereas we are now moving more and more, at least in some member states, towards a vision of ERTMS as being the European rail uh, traffic management system. Um, we have, uh, to a certain extent, uh, quite a shift in thinking, which also affects, to a certain extent, ERTMS, because we have a rollout which is no longer along the corridors in order to guarantee the interoperability, which was our major driver in the past. But we have a network-wide rollout of ERTMS in a number of member states, and I think this is quite uh, significant. So my first message in my work plan, but also now, is we have to accelerate on the track side the rollout of uh, ERTMS. Um, we have to move towards thinking a network approach, and we probably also need to find ways of dealing with regional lines, um, uh, which are less frequented, uh, in terms of making sure that also there you can roll, uh, you can uh, actually use them only with ERTMS only. Uh, I think also that we have to start discussing seriously advancing the rollout of ERTMS on the overall TNT network. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, a deadline of 2050. I think we can uh, go for a deadline of 2040, perhaps with a number of exceptions, but we should be thinking about that. Third, what I think is very important is that we now move towards a deadline for the phasing out of Class B systems. This will be also then the driver for the rollout of ERTMS. At the moment, we have a situation where, in reality, um, uh, we have no European approach in terms of Class B systems. Um, you can either immediately switch them off once you have implemented ERTMS, uh, ETCS, um, um, uh, trackside, or uh, you can give a, a, a period of delay, and, or you can actually decide to run them in parallel at infinitum. I think we need to grasp the nettle in terms of making sure that ERTMS is the only European rail traffic management system in the future. Um, this leads me to two, two elements. First of all, at the moment, I see that we have ERTMS islands. And then we have bridges, the Class B bridges, um, between these islands. Um, and these islands are uh, uh, very often uh, outside the nodes, outside the terminals, and are not cross-border. And uh, the bridges are then Class B in the nodes, in the terminals, and cross-border. And we have to try and get rid of these bridges and make sure that we do also a rollout in terms of ERTMS, uh, in terms of terminals, nodes, um, and, and, and cross-border. But the second and more important point is in reality, and, and a number of you have experienced that uh, on the ground, you cannot only think about track site, you really need to think about uh, onboard and um, immediately, in terms of making sure that there are enough vehicles and locomotives there in terms of uh, actually using the system, because otherwise it becomes impossible to switch off the class B systems. And we have seen a number of the delays in the last years actually uh, linked to the fact that there was not enough, there were not enough uh, locomotives and vehicles available uh, in terms of uh, ETCS uh, equipment. Um, Morton, you have already said all I wanted to say in terms of digitalization. Um, there are a number of things, uh, whether it is also the digital interlockings, whether it is uh, the digital automatic coupling, uh, uh, the big game changes that we're thinking about in terms of TSI uh, in the future. And I'm quite sure that uh, Ian uh, Conlon will also talk a little bit about that. Um, but we really need to grasp the nettle in terms of making sure that all the, the, the future radio uh, management systems, we need to grasp the nettle in terms of making sure that uh, we are actually um, moving forward with digitalization uh, of rail. Just a few words on funding. 
Yes, we spent something like uh, 800 million on ERTMS last year, uh, the last period with uh, with uh, with CEF one. Yes, we will probably have something between 1 billion and a little bit more uh, in terms of CEF2 for ERTMS. Um, let me also be very clear and uh, reiterate what Morton was saying. We are competing with electric charging stations, hydrogen stations. We are competing with other things uh, now than we were competing in the past. And, and because of that, we have to make sure that we come with very good and mature uh, projects. Um, I'm still putting a lot of hope on the recovery and resilience facility, uh, and we will see how much uh, ERTM is actually envisaged in that. Um, but we all know that we need, in order to get to the deadlines only of the European deployment plan in terms of onboard and uh, track site, we need something like 15 billion spending uh, in the next years up to 2030, uh, and 1 billion is not a lot in relationship to that. So let's hope that the recovery and resilience facility is being adequately used. Last point, yes, ERTMS has to evolve, it has to modernize, it has to become more and more a plug-and-play system, it has to grasp a, a number of other uh, uh, elements, but we also need to be able to manage the transition in an intelligent way so that there's actually also the, um, the will to do investment today rather than to wait until new standards are uh, established tomorrow. And this is part of the work that we are doing uh, with ERA, part of the work that we will hopefully also be doing in the systems pillar of the next joint undertaking Europe's Rail. Uh, where we will be thinking about the evolution, but also about the managed transition in terms of uh, ERTMS now. But I'm very much convinced that if we manage to make the shift to a radio-based ERTMS in the next few years, that we will actually have the rail traffic management system of the future, not only for Europe, but for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthias. And we move to Martin now. Martin, yes. the word is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matthias uh, Rutte said that uh, ERTMS is going to be the digital backbone of the railways of the future. So I will uh, present you where we stand with the construction of this uh, digital backbone in Europe. Please, uh, next slide. And uh, explain you uh, the, the progress in ERTMS uh, deployment track site in comparison to the assumptions laid down in the European Deployment Plan from 2017. So we are at the moment uh, at 56% uh, of what was set for 2021. If we take the target of 2020, we are at 60% uh, with 7,000 kilometers uh, already in operation. Uh, the length of the network on the core network corridor that was supposed to be put in operation by the end of 2020 was 11,000 uh, kilometers. So you can see that there is a, a sort of a, a delay of roughly 4,000 kilometers. But this is a, a bit a mixed picture uh, because firstly uh, we are uh, making a, a major progress in cleaning up of the pending lines from the previous years. So there are only uh, very few lines from 2017 that are still pending and all of them are already equipped and should be put in operation in this year. Uh, the same goes for the pending lines uh, from 2018. There are still some uh, 800 kilometers of those lines, but the vast majority is already equipped and should be put in operation this year. Uh, last year, there was a sort of a big bang according to the EDP because uh, Member states were supposed to put in operation uh, almost 4,000 kilometers. Unfortunately, only 600 kilometers were put in operation, but many lines are already equipped and should be put in operation in the course of this year. So we can uh, say that uh, we have at the moment 7,000 kilometers already in operation, but we hope that in the course of this year, uh, we will have between 1,500 and 2,000 kilometers put in operation in Europe, if everything goes well, of course. 
Next slide, please. So we are not only looking backward on what was put in operation and what was supposed to be put in operation, but we try to analyze the situation per core network corridor and see uh, not only the lines in operation, but also those lines that are under construction. And there you can see that the picture is much more positive because the vast majority of the lines are already under construction per core network corridor. And we made also uh, additional effort to see uh, what is the percentage of lines that are also covered by contracts, including the framework contracts. And then we can see that uh, almost 95% of all lines are already covered by contracts. It means that they will be indeed uh, put in operation commission sooner or later. Next slide, please. Uh, the previous slide was about the 2023 target. Now uh, we know that uh, we should deliver all core network corridors by 2030. And uh, you can see that this picture is a bit less positive because uh, on some core network corridors, the percentage of the lines uh, with, uh, in operation is relatively low, starting from 7% up to 30%. And if you look at the lines uh, contracted, uh, the range is, is between 26% and 68%. So there is still a, a major effort to be done. Next slide, please. We also try to analyze the situation, not only on the core network corridors as such, but to see what the situation is uh, in the whole uh, Europe. And uh, so we analyzed uh, what is the percent, what is the number of uh, lines uh, uh, contracted and uh, we came to a conclusion based on the information from UNICEF but also from uh, data from different member states that at the moment at the, at the moment uh, 34 per 30 33,000 kilometers in um, European Union are contracted and uh, including those that are already in operation and if you look at Europe as as uh, EU 27 plus uh, Norway, Switzerland and uh, United Kingdom, we are uh, at the level of 41,000 kilometers in Europe. So which uh, brings us much closer to the objective of 50,000 kilometers to be put in operation on core network corridors. Of course, not all those lines are supposed to be uh, on core network corridors, but we can see that uh, the, the progress is, uh, is in the right direction. Um, uh, we also uh, came uh, to a conclusion that we have already in operation over 10,000 kilometers of ETCS uh, and 70% uh, of uh, those lines are on the core network uh, corridors and the rest outside. Next slide, please. Some conclusions. Um, so we can see that uh, there is a, a sort of a delay again but we are trying to catch up with the lines that were supposed to be put in operation a couple of years earlier. So we can see a clear pattern that the vast majority of the lines have a deadline N plus two or N plus three, meaning that they are put in operation two to three years later than initially foreseen. And what is also positive that the vast majority of the lines that were supposed to, to be put in operation are indeed under construction. And we can see that there are delays also in those countries that decided to go for network wide deployment. Uh, like, for example, in Belgium, in, in Denmark, we can see, see also delays in, in Sweden. It's uh, in many cases also linked to the fact that uh, rolling stock is not available. At the same time, we can see also more and more countries interested in um, network-wide uh, deployment, and there are more and more robust uh, plants, like in Italy, in Czechia, in, in Germany, and even in uh, Estonia, and going for uh, network-wide deployment of ERTMS. And uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, deploying uh, ERTMS on the entire core network by 2030 will be a particular challenge uh, because uh, at the moment we have uh, in EU 27, 63,000 kilometers on the core uh, network. So we have really to move the gear up 
and uh, deploy every year at least uh, four to five thousand kilometers to meet this uh, objective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, I will hand over to Ian now. Thank you, Morten. Good morning to everyone. Uh, if we could move on to the first slide. So uh, thank you to Matthias and Marcin for the strategic and uh, deployment overview. I will give you very briefly um, because in the end, the point of the workshop is about uh, project implementation and addressing uh, implementation on the ground, if you like, but very briefly uh, a picture of current uh, policy direction um, and the, the regulatory and governance framework that is uh, being put into place and being put into place. This first slide is quite dense textually. I won't go through it all at all. My main point is here in terms of the um, the regulatory framework that has been put in place through the fourth railway package, but also through um, the uh, implementation of the CCS TSI. Um, there are uh, quite a lot of changes that have been made um, era as the LTMS system authority being a very significant one, uh, but also um, the stability of the, the baseline three specifications since 2016 um, and improved frameworks um, for uh, the uh, adaption of onboards um, to changes in uh, the specifications, which uh, even though they've been talked about for a long time, years even, uh, in terms of implementation, they are only just happening now. Um, so member states um, either uh, implemented uh, the, uh, the the technical pillar of the fourth railway package uh, in June last year or the previous year. Um, so these steps um, which have been put in place as part of these uh, important pieces of legislation will make an impact and will address um, a lot of the points that Morton was highlighting as difficulties within the LTMS, but they will start appearing from now essentially they will uh, they will begin happening now so um, that's essentially the current state of play based on the past um, if we go to the next slide um, I will just give you uh, a, a brief glimpse of what we are looking to do in terms of immediate changes to um, the CCS TSI within which the um, ETCS and GSMR specifications sit um, essentially, there are three elements linked to the next revision, um, but two broad ideas. Um, the first broad idea is as, and as Matthias was describing, ERTMS becomes much more significant across the union in terms of network deployment and vehicles deployed. Um, we need a, a more robust process to manage the system both in terms of how errors are corrected, how specifications are updated, but also um, how functional changes are made. Um, so there needs to be an improvement in the way that the specifications are managed and involved. So that's one key part of the, uh, of the TSI revision. And then the other two key elements are first, the steps towards uh, a more modular onboard architecture so that from a technical perspective changes to the system are more straightforward and then third the the introduction of uh, certain important functionalities themselves for example ATO and on the radio side paving the way for future radio products for uh, so allowing the onboard to be FRMCS ready um, essentially so th the message for 2022 is um, we are providing a framework through which the uh, the system can be managed uh, and evolved better and also introducing uh, key important functionalities which will improve the system. That's for 2022. Then looking longer term, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, essentially we are looking, uh, and this is mirroring also what Matthias said, in terms of the, the longer term evolution of the system. If and when member states um, switch to ERTMS and radio based ERTMS, our simple assertion is that it does not make sense to perpetuate 
national systems um, for such approaches. And this therefore goes beyond ETCS and radio. And uh, our view is, and this is supported by the actions of a number of infrastructure managers uh, already, that there should be greater harmonization for the broader approach. So not just ETCS and GSMR, but for the broader elements of the of the CCS system. And to support that process, as part of the new um, joint undertaking, Europe's um, rail joint undertaking, there will be a new structure within it called the system pillar, which will be the tool, um, uh, which will have specific budget and specific governance structure, but it will be the tool for the sector in the wider sense, infrastructure managers, operators, suppliers, etc., um, to converge on common solutions for evolution. So we don't propagate the situation that we've had in the past in rail, that we have national bespoke systems driving higher costs. That is the longer term ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, for, for your presentation also. Indeed, as you, as you said, the, the, the main purpose of, of, of the workshop is to uh, gain feedback from from the projects that have been implementing uh, successfully their projects or and and uh, have some good uh, tips to share with us about how to uh, better uh, anticipate problems and how to uh, to address issues so that projects can be more successful in in their implementation nevertheless the the workshop is also a very good opportunity to to share a little bit on on the latest updates on in in, in the policy context so so thank you very much to to matthias martin and you for for these presentations and then we indeed move on to to the next and namely the the feedback from the beneficiaries with regard to their uh, experience from implementing yes actions uh, so i would like to hand over the the word to 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 kenny from infrabel who will give us the first presentation about their experience. The word is yours, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, dear colleagues from uh, all over Europe. I am Kenny van Uversveen. Since 2012, I'm working for Infrabel, the Belgian infrastructure manager, as the pro program manager ETCS level two, and also as team lead of the project leaders, generic development, pilot projects, and rollout projects. Next slide, please. Uh, this presentation conti contains two major parts. Uh, so before sharing our experiences on the ERT MS actions, we have an execution. I will give you a very short introduction regarding our master plan ETCS and its current state of play. And then in the second part, we go deeper in the experience exchange on the action ETCS level two and interlocking generic development. So to give a bit of background, uh, in 2010, we had in Belgium a very unfortunate accident in Beuzing with uh, 19 people dead and many, many severely injured. And we have uh, drawn up a master plan ETCS based on recommendations of an investigation commission initiated by the Belgian parliament. Uh, first, we had to speed up the national ATP TBEL 1 plus implementation by the end of 2015. Uh, unfortunately, this ATP has no uh, speed supervision, so we have only the stop function and TB11 plus. Uh, then we implemented it, making use of ETCS components. Uh, it's in fact a packet 44 solution, so we use the uh, ETCS hardware uh, to implement already uh, the national uh, ATP. So we could reduce it afterwards to speed up the ETCS implementation. The second uh, recommendation was that we had to deploy ETCS faster so that all trains are equipped uh, by the end, all trains are protected uh, with ETCS by the end of 2025. Uh, there were already plans, but it had to be uh, sped up. And finally, in 2018, this was put into law, so it's uh, mandatory. Uh, for us, ETCS is a crucial step towards further digital evolution, with even more uh, benefits, uh, uniform level two, level three, ATU deployment, and decommissioning of the existing line side signaling. But the first serious step here is to uh, implement ATCS everywhere on our network. Next slide, please. So where are we today? Uh, we have equipped uh, at this moment 30% of our 6,400 kilometers track with ATCS in a combination of uh, 1,670 kilometers ATCS level one full supervision, 
this level one food supervision deployment is quite industrialized now and we have a lot of experience with it now so we have a stable delivery and ATCS level one food supervision. Since last year, we have also 72 kilometers of ETSS level one limited supervision and service. Here we had to follow the pace of the onboard migration towards baseline three. Uh, the good news is the track side hardware here is mostly deployed on the entire network. And now we need to uh, put the data prep uh, in it. So this can also go can also go on a fast industrialized way. And then we have 30 kilometers on, of ETSS level two uh, full supervision and service on the conventional network. We are still ramping up here. Uh, you will more. Uh, you will learn more on this uh, later in the presentation. And on our high speed lines three and four, you can see it in green. We have both level one uh, full and uh, level two full supervision and service. So already 30% of tracks, much uh, still to do. Uh, next slide, please. So now we'll go a bit more into the action uh, level two and interlocking generic development. So. For being able to deploy ETCS level two nationwide, we had to do generic development, both for interlocking and ETCS. So this generic development gives a blueprint uh, technically and documentation wise for the rollout projects so that they can be uh, realized in an in industrialized way on the entire net. I also mentioned interlocking because we install ETCS level two only on lines with electronic interlocking. But because a lot of lines are still in relay interlocking, we needed to upgrade them for ETCS level two. We have put that both in, a, in one contract worth of 510 million euros, uh, which we awarded uh, in 2015. Uh, this generic development and implementation on a pilot line, that is the part that is uh, funded. And for us, it's a crucial enabler for uh, our entire master plan and equipping the entire network of uh, InfraBAL uh, with ETCS. We have done it in a couple of steps for being able to deliver as fast as possible the benefits and implementing it in online. So our first uh, project we had is implementing ETCS level two on existing electronic interlocking. You can see it in orange there. This project is already in service since 2018. It works uh, very good. Operators are, uh, are happy with it and the train drives as well. And this project made us uh, capable to deploy level two on a vast amount of lines where you already had the electronic uh, interlocking. Uh, second, uh, more on the interlocking side, we had the development of electronic interlocking for automatic block section. This is in service since 2019. And this project made us capable of upgrading uh, existing relay block sections uh, to electronic block sections and later on put ETCS also on it. And the third project is still ongoing. That is a pilot project uh, in making more complex electronic interlocking uh, on, a, on a grid. And this still has to be uh, commissioned and is under further, uh, further uh, deployment. Uh, so for us, uh, the action uh, 2014 is a major enabler for our, uh, ETCS master plan by giving the blueprints for uh, ETCS uh, level two and interlocking uh, deployment. Next slide, please. But yeah, of course, we had to tackle many challenges. Um, so first, we had to ensure the coherence with existing signaling system. We use level two as an overlay to the existing lateral signaling because not all trains have ETCS on board yet. So the ETCS level two information for the driver had to be fully coherent with the line side signaling because drivers uh, could uh, react uh, to something if they see in quarantine, so we had to make it uh, coherent. Additionally, we also had to have the same principle of level one. We have long history in deploying level one. Uh, and if a train driver drives on level one and level two lines on the same day, the principles have to be uh, the same because differences would confuse them, also in degraded scenarios. And of course, yeah, then yeah, we also had uh, safety, availability and capacity. We could not touch that and improve wherever possible. So you can imagine that we had a lot of constraints uh, to, the, to the project. If you also imagine the combination of different ETCS level transitions, a lot of difference in the rolling stock having or not having ETCS, you can imagine it's a huge puzzle. So whenever possible, we try to reap the extra benefits next to safety and interoperability of level two, while keeping the functional and system requirements of the existing uh, system um, uh, which is in service because we had that mixed traffic ETCS uh, and not ETCS uh, trains. 
Uh, but yeah, reaping the extra benefits that uh, that didn't always uh, work. Uh, for example, we could with level two achieve uh, shorter headways and reducing sections, subsections. But because we had to remain uh, current with line side signaling, yeah, then uh, I mean, we could not do it because we then had to the driver let pass a closed signal, for example, when he would drive in ETCS level two, and that was not acceptable. So it's a first step, and we uh, will reap the final benefits if we can uh, remove the, the lateral uh, line side signaling. On the challenge two, I already said uh, uh, something. Uh, we go faster through it, so we have a very, very big mix of trains uh, with different levels. We have trains with no ATCS, trains with only level one full supervision, trains with different baselines ATCS, with different break-in performances. And we had to take that into consideration uh, in, the, in the design. And that, uh, that is very complex and this takes, uh, takes a lot of, of time. Uh, when that would not be the case, uh, that having that mix, it would be uh, more, more and easy uh, to implement ETCS. Next slide, please. So our ETCS implementation, that is on an existing line side signal network, which we call a brownfield. It is an overlay uh, ETCS for us. And the track layout, uh, we don't, we didn't want to change it because also that takes a lot of time and it is in commercial service uh, every day. So the flexible flexibility is, uh, is uh, enormously limited, which uh, imposes another constraint uh, on the project. We had also compatibility issues in the sense of coherence, ETCS and lateral signaling operation. So because ETCS could not reproduce directly the lateral signaling aspects and principles, for example, small stop signals and access to line and TBL in plus at reduced speed. We had to find workarounds for it with the toolbox we had, or we had to remove functionalities in the line side signaling together with our operator colleagues. Uh, we also had a lot of issues with permissive signals. Uh, so, of course, uh, the conventional network is in that sense much harder to equip than the high speed lines. Uh, more itineraries, more speed limits, more operational scenarios, more different uh, rolling stock. Next slide. So, in fact, uh, I included a graphic which uh, shows it all. It's 90% uh, is below the water. So ETCS uh, implementation is more than the, the rollout uh, in service. Uh, we had to do a lot. We had to procure ETCS interlocking exterior civil and cabling works, works tools. We had to develop an interface with existing electronic interlocking so the RBC could listen to it. We had to do upgrades to the solid state electronic interlocking we had. We had to do the generic development uh, to make the blueprint or the Bible for the different layouts on the rollout projects. We had to prove it works and keeps working with pilot lines, learn a lot from them. We had to develop tools to, to adapt the existing uh, Packet 44 TBL1 Plus uh, solution. Uh, we had to do the GSMR extension and certification. Uh, we had to adapt regulation internally and externally. We had to even uh, certify our measurement campaign uh, where we measure the necessary parameters for ATCS, gradients, distances. We had to build a test center, but also uh, a much more softer project. We have also HR projects. We had to uh, have a look how to hire and retain new people, how to train them because the amount of experts uh, ATCS available on the market is, uh, of course, very low uh, with us. You cannot uh, learn it uh, at the university. Uh, collaboration uh, environment uh, to, to work uh, together. Also, that, that are a lot of projects uh, to do. Uh, we had to define them, plan them, coordinate them uh, to achieve uh, the benefits of uh, ATCS. Uh, for us, it's mainly safety and interoperability, of course. And uh, I'm really convinced that an early identification and projectized approach of all of those enablers is crucial. You have to projectize all these projects here involved. We have a couple of hard lessons. Uh, yeah, the turnkey approach which we had implemented on contract side, uh, uh, yeah, we, 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 it remained uh, quite complex because the suppliers need a lot of uh, support to translate the national principles into the, the interoperable ATCS language, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable. And we also, unfortunately, some ATCS and interlocking requirements as specified were not achievable by the by the, the, the one who got uh, the contract. So we had unexpected updates of genetic products and uh, we had to find a really a lot of workarounds in the meanwhile. A current showstopper is that RBC version which we use uh, for the full deployment uh, cannot deliver an RBC handover 
uh, on a way which is acceptable for uh, for our operation. So we had to ask for a modification of the RBC hardware. The certification process is making ETCS and interlocking development very hard and time consuming. So involve experience, but also pragmatic people early in the process to put up a decent framework. This is of course easier said than done. Uh, but unfortunately, we had to spend a lot of time on really non-technical ATCS topics and uh, implement um, new processes, plans, full traceability, competence uh, documentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we also noticed that safety it's uh, it's it's not a stand it's a standard, but it's also a philosophy with a lot of stakeholders having another vision on it, how it needs to be proved. So we need to align all those stakeholders early in the process that they are happy the way how you demonstrate the safety and also really try to understand uh, the, the way of working at the supplier, at the assessment body, at the, the infra manager, that uh, you really understand each other and take a lot of time for it. And there are technical surprises behind every corner every day. Uh, so next slide, the success factors uh, for me. Um, want to share here, although time is limited, want to share here some factors with you. Really strive that supplier and the contracting authority act as one, one team with open communication. So be sure that you understand each other, preferably sit in the same room. Uh, as I said earlier, you have to confront the specs with the possibilities. And if something cannot be done on the way it was foreseen, you need to find solutions together by workarounds. Uh, and do not trigger immediately the contractual uh, 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 guys. Uh, you have to find solutions, work around. And if everybody gets in the trenches, uh, for example, this is my spec, you shall realize it. Not open for discussion. Uh, you will not find the solutions and you will waste a lot of valuable time. Uh, also assess early the capabilities of the supply products and adapt, adapt your expectations to them or find creative workarounds. Involve all the stakeholders, maintenance, clients, and as a uh, soon and listen to the requirements, manager expectations. I strongly believe in this one. Maintenance clients should be involved heavily in drafting the requirements. The goal is not only implement interoperability, it should also work, it should be maintainable. And uh, another one before the real pilot project, do another agile project early without considering scene like too much. Focus then on the technical part. This will for sure help to define achievable requirements. And last but not least, we had also a very good collaboration and open communication with INEA. We presented our status as it was and found with INEA a listening ear. And we appreciate very much all support uh, we received in that uh, sense. We, yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. I sincerely hope we meet again soon in real life. Hang in there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you and all together for ERTMS. Thank you very much, Kenny, for, for this very interesting uh, presentation uh, and, and also with a very, very good feedback. And of course, also the positive note at, at, at the end, which is uh, very important to keep in mind also. Um, I will now hand over to uh, to Thomas, who will give us a presentation on, on the experience from the Czech Republic. Thomas, the word is yours. OK, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen from the Czech Republic. Uh, please let me to introduce shortly uh, RTMS implementation in the Czech Republic and also uh, projects or two projects uh, which uh, was uh, financed by CEF and uh, which are, were successfully uh, finished uh, in the last year. Uh, my name is Tomáš Konopáč. I am from strategy department from uh, Správa Železnic, uh, that's Railway Infrastructure Manager in the Czech Republic. And I'm responsible actually for um, uh, coordination of uh, ETCS implementation in the uh, track site uh, in the Czech Republic. So please, the first slide. So uh, currently I can confirm and I can highlight uh, the priority of uh, ETCS implementation in the Czech Republic because uh, after uh, some serious accidents, uh, some unfortunate uh, uh, events which uh, which uh, came last year, 
our Ministry of Transport uh, decided to implement uh, ATP system for the old lines in the Czech Republic uh, by uh, 2040. And uh, I can confirm that uh, this, this system, this ATP system, uh, is uh, only ERTMS. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we will uh, no more install uh, Class B systems for the lines uh, where uh, we have no ATP. So the ERTMS is uh, the only, only system for the future for the Czech Republic. Uh, maybe uh, please the next slide. Uh, here on this map, uh, you can see uh, the main main uh, data and uh, the main main uh, timetable for uh, ETCS implementation for the core ten T lines. So uh, we will speak about two uh, two uh, dark blue lines, uh, which are which are finished. And you can see we have now uh, five uh, five sections uh, which are in in uh, in process of implementation. These orange sections and uh, the the last uh, the violet sections uh, are now in planning or in in some some uh, phases of uh, preparation. Please next slide. Uh, so uh, here you can see the list of uh, actions uh, of uh, ETCS implementation which are financed uh, from CEF. So these uh, first and second lines I will I will uh, mention in my talk uh, later. Uh, these actions are completed and are successfully finished uh, in, in the Czech Republic. And uh, the last two uh, sections uh, which are in dark blue uh, are in process now in, in um, in preparation or implementation, and uh, we expect uh, the fine, maybe final, final, finalizing of these actions in uh, this or the next year. So on this map, you can see the location. You, you can see that all the uh, CEF uh, financed actions are uh, laying on the uh, 10T uh, core lines. And the first, uh, please, next slide. First project is uh, here. That's the track uh, from uh, the state border to uh, to Slovak Republic and, and uh, uh, Austria, uh, from Břeclav uh, through Přerov, Ostrava, Bohumín uh, to Petrovice u Karvine, which uh, lies uh, near the border with uh, Poland. So please, next slide. So this, uh, as I mentioned, this action uh, was completed in uh, the, uh, the uh, final uh, of last year. And uh, these actions uh, uh, concluded ETCS uh, L2, level two, uh, for uh, about uh, 200 uh, kilometers long section from, uh, from uh, Petrovice to Břeclav. And in uh, Břeclav, uh, it was uh, it was interconnected with uh, other uh, ETCS L2 equipped line, which was uh, which was uh, took in uh, operation in 2018. So there was uh, made a handover between these two projects. Uh, the grant agreement was signed in 2015, and uh, there were some amendments, two amendments uh, during the, the process. And uh, the official end of the action was uh, in uh, June of uh, 2020, as you can see on the slide. Uh, this line is the part of the uh, Baltic Adriatic 10T core network corridor. So that's uh, one of the most important lines uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, this uh, total investment uh, about uh, more than uh, 23 uh, million euro was uh, financed from CEF uh, more than 85%, uh, so you can see the numbers on the picture or on the slide. So, uh, about uh, some technical technical data, uh, the line uh, has two tracks uh, and two big railway junctions, which were equipped uh, in Přerov and in Ostrava, which were equipped also by ETCS Level 2. Uh, the whole line uh, has uh, ETCS L2 baseline 3 release 2 according to TSI CCS. It means uh, the uh, specification of the version 360. 
but uh, we uh, should equip uh, system version 1.1 because of uh, the backwards compatibility with uh, on boards uh, of uh, baseline 2 and baseline 3 because uh, nowadays in the Czech Republic uh, the vast majority of vehicles has a baseline 2 on board, so that's why we uh, have to uh, ensure the compatibility also with these vehicles. That's why uh, this technical, technical detail. The project contains about uh, 3,370. Eurobalis is fixed. Eurobalis is because we have, uh, we are in level two and six RBCs. You can see uh, the division of, uh, uh, of RBCs on the slide. Uh, these two junctions, as I mentioned, Přerov uh, and Ostrava has, uh, has uh, its own RBC and the uh, last uh, four RBCs uh, uh, covers uh, some part of the track uh, about 30, 50 kilometers. It depends on the uh, concrete situation and uh, technical, technical uh, status and operational status of the, on the line. So please, uh, the next slide. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, in Břeclav Hrušky, there was uh, made an interconnection or handover with uh, the current, with the existing ETCS uh, L2, which was uh, implemented uh, uh, in the project uh, ETCS from Kolín uh, through Česká Třebová and Brno to Břeclav and to state border. And uh, on the uh, opposite side in Petrovice, Karvine, near the state border uh, between the Czech and uh, Czech Republic and uh, Poland, uh, was uh, prepared, uh, a, let's say, automatic entrance to the uh, L2 area from or for the vehicles which are uh, coming from, from Poland. Uh, on the line are uh, 25 uh, connecting stations or co stations uh, with uh, with uh, connection of uh, of other other uh, lines. So on these uh, in these stations uh, were prepared uh, automatic or manual entrances to the area according to a specification, and we have uh, also. Uh, about uh, 38 stations so with uh, different type of uh, interlockings. So there was a challenge to uh, connect uh, RBCs uh, to these uh, to these uh, systems. So we have uh, electronic interlockings, uh, station interlockings uh, type uh, ESA, as uh, as it mentioned. We have also hybrid type. It means uh, that's a combination of uh, relay and electronic interlocking uh, type ETB, and also a relay system uh, from this uh, company AJD. So all these uh, station interlockings were connected uh, to the RBCs and successfully, uh, maybe successfully, uh, put in function. On the open line, there are uh, two main uh, types of, uh, of uh, systems, uh, automatic block type ABE and uh, relay automatic block uh, as this, uh, this abbreviation. All the lines uh, or all the systems are with line side signals because uh, nowadays we are uh, operating the ETCS in a mixed operation. It means uh, we can operate uh, vehicles with ETCS with on board all and also uh, ETCS uh, with all vehicles without ETCS on board. But uh, since uh, 2025, we are planning ETCS only operation on on this uh, line. And after 2025, we can gradually uh, leave the line side signals or reduce the line side signals, not all, but uh, the vast majority of them, and to uh, to leave uh, also Class B system. But to 2025, we must uh, we must ensure. Uh, both. So, on the next slide, you can see uh, the activities which were uh, maybe the, from the technical point of view uh, part of the project. Uh, so, it was uh, installation and positioning of uh, Eurobalises, uh, fixed Eurobalises. We are preferring uh, the system of Vortok clamp. That's the system for for uh, for fixing the Eurobalises to the rail yard. Uh, then the adaptation, as I mentioned, of station open in line interlockings, relay, hybrid or 
uh, electronic, installation of RBCs. Uh, all the RBCs are installed in Přerov, in our central dispatcher workplace. So there is one room, one technological room where are all the RBCs uh, uh, focused. And also uh, there were some uh, parts of addition and extension of uh, GSMR networks. It means uh, a few few uh, base uh, transceiver stations and also connection between RBCs and master switching center of uh, our uh, GSMR network in the Czech Republic. Uh, in this project, it was the first uh, in the Czech Republic where we uh, implemented integrated uh, or integral uh, HMI uh, of RBC and also uh, the station and open line and uh, level crossing interlockings. So the dispatchers have uh, the only only desktop or only HMI uh, from which they can operate on the one side uh, ETCS, it means RBC, uh, maybe some 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 uh, TSRs, etc. And also uh, the station and open line interlockings. Uh, during the project, there were some uh, some delays, also some project problems as in all projects uh, can can uh, can uh, be. Uh, there were some problems at the first uh, first step, first part uh, with uh, public tender because we have to uh, to uh, prepare or to tender uh, in more. Uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, documentation and also there were some some uh, maybe parallel actions, uh, modernizing actions which uh, concluded a reconstruction of interlocking system in uh, the station Bohumin. That's a quite a big station or uh, railway node. Uh, and uh, also uh, some some modernization on the section Ostrava, Petrovice, Ukarvine. So that's why there were some uh, cooperation or coordination of uh, modernization of infrastructure with implementing of ETCS. So please the next slide. So here you can see uh, the RPCs in uh, the central dispatcher uh, place in Přerov uh, in the technological room. Uh, on the right side you can uh, see or right picture you can see uh, the monitor, the view of uh, the uh, HMI uh, for the uh, maintenance workers, which is also in the in Přerov. And on the next slide. You can see Eurobalises, which are fixed by a uh, system Vortok clamp, as I mentioned in the previous my talk, uh, in a rail yard, uh, also BTS station of GSMR and uh, some some uh, genre picture from the rail yard. On the next slide are uh, certificates, which uh, uh, confirm the successful uh, completion of the project. So EC certificate uh, from our Nobo uh, VUZ and uh, EC declaration from the supplier Asia D. So the next slide, please. We also uh, are solving uh, some issues, some compatibility issue in this uh, line or in this project, because uh, during uh, compatibility tests between uh, onboard uh, called Atlas 200 and uh, our track site, uh, which is implemented on this uh, Břeclav Petrovice uh, section uh, was uh, was detected uh, some uh, un um, uncompatibilities, let's say, be between uh, this uh, this uh, two two parts. Uh, it uh, it's uh, due to uh, incorrect onboard reaction to uh, packet uh, 135. It is a packet which which uh, solves uh, the stop shunting on the scopening. So that's why we had to uh, change uh, the telegrams in uh, Bali's groups on the line because uh, or it was a problem of the onboard. But we we had to or we we uh, we uh, accepted the request of uh, the supplier of uh, this on board and we uh, made uh, this uh, this uh, change on the on the track side so uh, we we uh, accepted th this this request and uh, we we uh, implemented the new telegrams into these bodies groups which are without without uh, this uh, packet 135 because 
there was this problem as I as I mentioned. So please the next slide. And the second action, uh, which I uh, briefly, briefly uh, try to introduce is uh, at ECS between Český Brod and Praha. You can also see on the map where, where this project uh, is uh, oriented. And uh, the on the next slide, uh, there is a brief a basic description. Uh, please, the next slide, uh, thank you. Uh, so this action is also completed. Uh, it's included uh, ETCS. Uh, uh, please, can you, uh, you give uh, the preview slide? Oh. So uh, the previous, uh, thank you, that's it. So it was completed. Uh, it includes ETCS L2 for uh, service 30, uh, 37 kilometers long uh, section. And uh, also that's uh, part of the 10T core network corridor. Uh, the grant agreement was signed uh, in 2016. And uh, also uh, it was uh, fine in the, uh, finished uh, in 2020 in December. So the investment costs, uh, costs you can see here. So. Uh, about half of the of the uh, total total costs was uh, contributed by CEF. On the next slide, slide 17, you can uh, see uh, some technical technical uh, details. It's a double line track. Also, it is yes, level two, baseline three, release two. This version 360, uh, that's the version which we would like to have for all the uh, projects uh, for the for the or for the for the future projects, um, all the future projects in Czech Republic. And also in this uh, project, we had to implement system version 1.1 because of backwards compatibility with baseline two and baseline three vehicles. Uh, this project includes uh, 682 Eurobalises and two RBCs. As uh, for the, for the uh, parts of the line, you can see see on the on the slide. Český Brod, Praha, Běchovice, and the second is uh, for the part of the uh, Prague Junction. And uh, uh, also we solved uh, here uh, automatic entrance to the ETCS L2 area uh, from from Kolín and from from Prague, and uh, six station interlockings which we had to uh, connect uh, uh, with RBC electronic uh, system, hybrid system, and relay system. Uh, that's uh, quite similar as I uh, described uh, by the previous project, uh, Břeclav Petrovice u Karviné. And also you can see the open line interlockings are the same types, so it was very very similar very close to the previous uh, system. On the next slide you can see uh, some some problems which we uh, solved or which were uh, which were parallel to this uh, project. Uh, there were some delays uh, uh, delays also at the first phase uh, during uh, uh, cancellation of the public tender because there were some some um, legal problems, legal requirements, which uh, we, we, we solved. And uh, also the coordination with uh, CEF blending, blending call, blending action, which uh, uh, currently uh, maybe modernizes the part of uh, the track between, uh, part of the line between Prague and Colleen. Because the uh, originally this project uh, uh, covered uh, the whole section Prague Colleen, but in a small part of the of the track, uh, we are uh, completely or we have to completely modernize uh, the infrastructure, sub substructure, superstructure, bridges, all the line due, uh, to to 2023. That's why this uh, SEF action was uh, shorted to uh, Prague Chesky Broad uh, section and this short part from Chesky Broad to Colleen uh, was uh, uh, was uh, uh, deleted from this uh, this section due to this uh, moderni modernization. So on the next slide you can see also certificates uh, for uh, this this action 
Český brod Praha. And I think that's, that's all for this, this project. And so we can conclude uh, uh, my uh, speech for today. So as I mentioned at uh, the beginning, uh, ERTMS, I can confirm it, that it's the only target ATP system uh, for the Czech Republic, for the Czech Railway Network, not only for 10 T lines, for core 10 T lines, but for the whole lines or for the whole uh, network because uh, class B uh, shall be installed uh, on the lines never more uh, as the first implementation it's it's not possible and uh, also we uh, now uh, we are now uh, staying uh, before the issue before the challenge to implement uh, some simplified solution of ERTMS for the regional lines we are discussing it with uh, European Commission and we are uh, preparing for discussing with uh, Europe European agency uh, because that's a very, very crucial, crucial issue uh, now in, in uh, our uh, railway network. So our implementing rules for 10 T lines, we are, we are uh, prepared to implement a full ETCS L2 and GSMR or in the future uh, FRMCS system as uh, the specification will be, will be available. Uh, for other important and uh, very busy regional lines to implement full ETCS L2 and GSMR or in some special cases maybe L1. And for the regional lines which are uh, now in operation in Czech Republic uh, to find a simplified solution which is compatible with onboard ETCS but which is applicable in a very short time because that's the first step how to how to equip these lines uh, with ATP and that's a crucial issue crucial issue now in the Czech Republic. Also uh, that's why we very appreciate uh, the grant instruments like uh, CEF which uh, supports the implementation of ERTMS especially for TNT and for important lines in the Czech Republic because uh, that's uh, that's for us very very uh, very appreciated and very very uh, very usable. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you have some questions, please uh, you can use the tools for that and I uh, wish you a nice day and good health. Thank you very much for all. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, for your presentation and, and uh, valuable uh, experience uh, that, that you are sharing with us. Um, we will now move to uh, the third and, and the last uh, presentation from the beneficiaries. This presentation is, is uh, regarding onboard and it is uh, by Peter from Alpha Train. So Peter, the word is yours. Thank you, Morten. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Peter Magetla. I'm the engineering director for Alpha Trains Locomotives. Uh, for the ones who don't know Alpha Trains, we are a leasing company and we effectively leasing both locomotives and passenger rolling stock in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. The project I'd like to show you briefly uh, about is basically a retrofitting fossil locomotives, shunting locomotives, uh, G1000 in that case, for both Germany and Luxembourg, from no ETCS to baseline 3, 3.4.0 in that case, a bit of the setup we had during the project, the lessons learned as such, and then towards the future and uh, CEF2 or CEF3, a bit of funding recommendations from our side as a rolling stock owner. Next slide, please. Right, as I said, we have got the uh, G1000s here, um, built by Foslo. Uh, the locomotives are about, were about when we installed it, about 15 years old. So, we can say half through the lifetime. How is it set up? We applied early uh, in the CEF funding projects in 2014 uh, for the application for ETCS. Back then, there was basically 3.4.0. 3.6 did not really exist as such. What we had to do internally, and I believe this is the case for most companies, we had to do a business case in turn to see how to at least partially or to some extent recover the investment here over the remaining lifetime of the of the assets of the locomotives. And here clearly 
without this uh, funding, um, that business case would have been very, very tricky, very complicated. Um, so this was a key, a key issue for us. What we came across when we moved into contractual negotiations with the suppliers, suppliers, I mean onboard system suppliers, ETCS suppliers, is basically the market back then in 2014, but still today is, uh, I don't want to say monopolistic, but it's limited in the numbers of suppliers you can contract uh, on, the, on, the, on the market. It's uh, basically limited to one or two per locomotive type, I would think. That makes it uh, not very competitive, I would say, on the market level. And what suppliers face also, and this uh, we share their concerns a bit, the um, the rollout, the certainty on the rollout in the infrastructure, not not blaming here the infrastructure colleagues really, but sometimes the, the, the uh, national plans are maybe not followed in, in terms of execution as expected. And then the suppliers on the other side on onboard cannot or do not want to commit on uh, implementing baseline three on board at a certain date, especially towards testing on infrastructure uh, on, on locomotives. Uh, next slide, please. Here yeah, about the summary what we talk about, a uh, bit insights to the locomotives. Um, initially, um, ETCS today is only operative in Luxembourg on a national level. So our operator here is CFO Cargo in that sense. And we had to install ETCS effectively to run Luxembourg ETCS as such, but also then in Germany on the national uh, legacy system, PCB. So we had basically to manage both systems on board. Next slide, please. Here are the, a couple of pictures from our lovely shunting loco, as you can see. Um, it's a single cab locomotive, basically uh, four axles, two boogies and a diesel engine inside. And this picture were taken after the DCS retrofitment on the Luxembourg infrastructure. Next slide, please. Just to give an insight on the supplier contract we set up and a bit our recommendation towards authorization strategy, which is a key item in, in such onboard projects. A uh, very brief uh, insight into how we designed the uh, implementation of ETCS and a bit about responsibilities and the rivers in this, in this contract. Authorization is key, as I said, without authorization from nowadays era before a national NSAs, you are not able to operate uh, after retrofitting it. So it was key for us to really see how we fit an ETCS baseline 3 into a 15-year-old diesel locomotive where space is limited and basically um, the design as such to integrate it was pretty challenging. What we then faced basically was the authorization timing. What normally happens is once you have retrofitted the prototype, you can submit your approval dossier as such to the authorities, which then have a couple of uh, a uh, legal time frame, I believe, of a couple of months, uh, four months or so, to review. Now, if some questions would come up, this could take longer. What we wanted to avoid is to have the locomotive stopped during this time. Basically, then the operator couldn't use it. We couldn't uh, uh, have any income on our side. So we came to a, a, a temporary solution to keep on operating it, but basically turning the ETCS off uh, during that period of time. And then in parallel, we obtained then the ETCS on approval, which then also gave us the chance to retrofit the remaining locomotives and to get the approval to operate ETCS in Luxembourg and then keep on running PCB in Germany. Next slide, please. Here, just a very one picture, I will not go into details, on how we integrated this into this shunting locomotive. Um, you just see the main elements here of the ETCS on board, which in principle every local rolling stock will need. Um, main uh, item is here the cubicle on the right hand side in the front of the loco, which uh, contains the, the heart of the ETCS as such. In the cabin, you have the displays which are needed for the driver to operate ETCS on board and to manage the locomotives. And then on the floor, clearly you have the antennas, the uh, radars, the wheel sensors, 
which is also on such a small locomotive sometimes an issue to bring this into uh, this area as you have already antennas from the national legacy systems installed. Next slide, please. Here, just a very simple um, example of what we faced during the installation. The driver's desk, you can see on the left hand side in the before picture how it was originally built. You can see basically there was no real space to put in one or two ETCS displays, so just uh, couldn't fit it. So we had to redesign it, and you can see on the right hand side in the after picture basically we moved up the uh, one element to the top. Uh, the ETCS then moved to the right, keeping in mind that you have to respect the regulations, you have to respect the, the sides of the of the drivers, they need to see what's going on the track and all the other regulations for the driver's caps. That's next slide. Supply so contract again. Um, we, and today also, we, we face a bit the issue that um, the signaling supplies as such um, are clearly the experts on signaling level, so TSI, CCS in that sense. What they normally do not offer um, is rolling stock level, so uh, lock and pass TSI and national um, requirements on rolling stock. So we said we, we split it, we split the contract responsibilities, so we did the rolling stock together with a couple of uh, external consultancy experts, and then the signaling supplier did the CCS level. That is key. It is, uh, it is as I said, it's, it's key to avoid gray zones in, the, in such a contract. It's, it's key that it, the, the rules are defined and who does what and when, because otherwise you might run into timing issues. And clearly, as you all know, the CEF grants have a key deadline behind. So by then you would have to submit your complete application. What is key, and this was mentioned by, by the previous speakers as well, uh, regular communication and meetings and follow-up is, is absolutely key to that. Um, we encountered several unexpected issues on technical level, on regulation level, and without the project uh, follow-up meetings and technical meetings, we would have struggled to get this, this done. Escalation procedure, I think, is standard in any project, but it, it did help also to define this up front in this project. Next slide, please. Lessons learned, indeed. Um, authorities. Um, and nowadays, again, it's ERA as one stop shop before we had additional, additional different national authorities. It was really key for us to, to really approach them early in the project, to, to inform them. Listen, we would like to go for the Baseline 3 upgrade on these type of locomotives for these type of countries and to show a bit the timing and the scope we wanted to do. That clearly helped. We had talked to, in this case, uh, ACF in Luxembourg and EBA in Germany <clears throat> to give them a bit of an upside on what's, what's coming their way. Also, um, authorizations might have unexpected limitations when you get them and most likely get them towards the funding deadline at least, or towards uh, when you need ETCS on, on, the, on the loco. Um, and these limitations might trigger uh, limitations operations for the operator, but also issues potentially for the grant agreement and the subsidy payments. So um, our learned uh, experience is a bit, make sure you have a pretty a buffer at the end towards the end of the project that you can deal with such limitations or unexpected uh, issues in the authorization and you can find a workaround with both the authorities, the operators and also then uh, INEA. Next slide, please. The same applies a bit for uh, the two uh, stakeholders here, INEA and INECO. Um, we all know who have done projects, we need uh, regular annual status reports as they call it. Uh, but what we experienced is basically a more regular project follow-up is, is, is key, uh, keeping INECO informed, keeping INEA informed, INECO clearly on the technical level, INEA on the project level, to know where we stand in case there might be issues and, and, and complications that can support to the extent they can. So that clearly helped a lot and uh, this I would just uh, recommend for any project in that, on that surface. Next slide, please. Right, recommendation summary. Um, 
uh, just following up on what everyone said in the last uh, two hours almost now. So ETCS is clearly the reality. It's here to stay. Um, it will not go away. So in terms of rolling stock, I think we should all consider what to do with our rolling stock uh, going forward. Do we want to upgrade to the ETCS? I would assume clearly the new builds. Yes, we'll come with ETCS in any case. On existing fleets like ours, now 15 years, uh, it's it's a bit maybe in, in, in at the limit in terms of uh, costs today uh, on the market. But um, in case we do not go for ETCS, obviously what's the alternative then to continue running the rolling stock? The self funding, as I said, is key. Um, without the self funding or in case available national funding. We would struggle most likely for the uh, existing stock to to upgrade or to even retrofit. So that is uh, also for the for the future. It was mentioned safe too, and I'm not sure how much the re reduction would be, but um, on, on, on the UTC TMS funding. But it is absolutely crucial for us uh, as as a rolling stock owner that this stays, that we can participate. Um, hopefully we get awarded as well, but we have a chance to have funding for these uh, still today expensive projects on, on rolling stock. What we see here, and this also uh, I think is, is recommended from our side and very welcome, we see good um, kind of cooperations between the EU funding scheme, so INEA and CEF, and our national schemes, um, that for example is the Dutch program um, we, we have now. We also participating in whereby basically the Dutch government funds part of the investment here and the other part is done by the CEF funding. That is clearly beneficial in terms of funding, but also it is it is helps us a lot, um, both us, the suppliers, and also the customers <coughs> to have a coordination or a coordinated approach towards the infrastructure rollout and the onboard retrofits. Um, given that in this case, Netherlands controls and manages both infrastructure and rolling stock. It really helps to um, to streamline the actions and to follow up in a coordinated way. <coughs> Next slide, please. And then finally, the last slide. Um, a big thank you to the INEA and the NECO team. Um, without you, honestly, this project would have been very complicated, if not impossible. So uh, thanks a lot for your help and uh, support during the project. And that's it uh, from my side, from the onboard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for your presentation and, and your kind words at, at the end. Um, and thank you to, to Kenny Thomas also for, for, for the very useful presentations about your experience implementing ERTMS projects. Uh, we will now start the, the Q&A session uh, related you know, to, uh, to, in particular, your presentations and, and the previous uh, uh, input also. Um, as, as you've seen from the agenda, we have two Q&A sessions. So some of the questions that we have already, we will keep for, for the second part of the, um, uh, of, for the second Q&A session. Um, I would also mention here that uh, in, if in some cases we cannot give a complete uh, reply to, to the questions here and now, the intention is anyway to publish uh, the, the questions and also the answers. And in case we cannot give a full answer here and now, we will then elaborate on, on the answer so that it is it will be complete in, in the uh, published version. Uh, and you will receive information also when, when this is available on, on the internet. Um, so with this, I will hand over to, to Piotr, who will uh, guide us through the the questions and, and guide the questions to to the persons who are, are most suitable to, to give an uh, answer to, to those questions. So Piotr, I, I give you the word and, and to direct the questions to uh, to the colleagues around the, the table, so to say, virtually at least. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Morten, very much. And thank to the participants who already asked a number of questions. Uh, before we start, let me remind that uh, if you already see your questions being addressed to a particular speaker, uh, don't hesitate flagging this in your question. Uh, by this, uh, it will be easier for us to identify immediately the speaker 
for most of the questions that we received now, uh, we made the uh, assignment on the best of our knowledge. So uh, for the first one mm, uh, that addresses the national funding and the EU funding, here I would ask uh, Morten to address this. Yes, thank you, Piotr. So, so in principle, the short answer is is yes. You can combine national funding with uh, with EU funds. Uh, there, there are of course a couple of, of principles. First of all, the combination of the the funding should not lead to more than uh, covering one hundred percent of the cost. So, it, it should not lead to lead to a profit uh, of combining the two sources of funding. Also, in some cases. Um, the, the f national funding requires uh, approval from from DG competition from the EU in in terms of, of uh, in in accordance with the state aid rules. Uh, so if if you are in a specific case, then I I would always invite you to 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 raise it with your EMEA project manager, and and then we will we will we will verify it also with uh, our internal pe people. But 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 the basic answer is yes you you can combine national funding with eu funding thank you thank you morten uh, the next two questions notably on the next generation eu program and the unit contribution uh, i would ask uh, digimove colleagues to address them uh yes so i will maybe take uh, those two uh, two questions uh the first question concerning the unit contributions um well, uh, I cannot say that uh, the unit contributions for the rolling stock uh, prevent uh, operators from benefiting uh, from uh, SEF funding. So the uh, the recent uh, SEF blending facility uh, uh, cutoff dates demonstrate that uh, there is an interest and actually all the projects submitted to regard to onboard uh, projects. Uh, having said this, um, uh, we are now in the process of revising this decision uh, with the view to using unit contributions also for the SEF uh, 2 projects and calls. And uh, in principle, we'll keep the, the current uh, unit contributions as they stand. However, we are thinking about adding additional unit contributions, especially for the uh, cohesion envelope uh, because uh, under the cohesion envelope uh, beneficiaries are in principle entitled to a higher co-funding rate and uh, for this reason would like to reflect it also in the level of uh, unit contributions under the cohesion uh, envelope so those unit contributions that exist at the moment will be uh, increased pro rata in order to reflect the higher unit contributions for the cohesion envelope Additionally, uh, and this is still pending, uh, we are also thinking about uh, addressing the issue of uh, unit uh, contribution in the nodes because we uh, realize that uh, there is a problem with the deployment of ERTMS in the major nodes and in some cases uh, member states uh, postpone deploying ERTMS in the nodes because it's uh, very costly and uh, time consuming and uh, challenging exercise. So we are trying to collect information on, on this aspect, but it's not related to uh, uh, onboard uh, deployment. And uh, there was also a question about RRF, if I understand correctly, yes? Uh, yes, please, Martin, please yes. address the, the second one. Yes, uh, the, the second one. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so we are uh, clearly in favor of using RRF uh, recovery and resilience facility for ERTMS deployment, both trackside and on board. So in all uh, meetings uh, we are attending, uh, we are trying to draw the attention of the member states to profit from this uh, situation. We are also trying to encourage uh, all stakeholders also to lobby uh, in the respective member states to uh, make use of the recovery and resilience facility. There is a, a significant amount uh, available, so over uh, 300 billion euros. So if we manage to use uh, only 1% of this amount for uh, the rolling stock, we might address all the problems related to um, retrofitting of the rolling stock uh, in Europe. And uh, if we use 3 to 5% of this amount, we might be uh, more um, 
uh, on the right track as regards the ERTMS deployment truck site. Having said this, um, some member states um, have acknowledged uh, this opportunity and uh, they will most probably ring fence uh, significant amounts for ERTMS deployment both on board or truck site. However, in some member states, uh, this amount is not, for, for example, for the time being, uh, ring fence for ERTMS. So we are conducting um, discussions uh, with uh, member states in this respect. We managed also to convince all the uh, commission uh, services that ERTMS is uh, uh, an opportunity for uh, the new Europe and the new European economy because it ticks off all the boxes. It's at the same time green and digital. So we should push as much as possible for using uh, recovery and resilience facility for um, ERTMS deployment. But at the same time, we should also notice that uh, we need mature projects. So all the projects uh, must be uh, finalized by 2026. So in principle, um, we cannot start from just ideas where to deploy ERTMS. We need uh, projects that are already in advanced stage or mature enough uh, to be able to be finalized within uh, the next uh, half, five and a half years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, the next question concerning the length of the funding period. This I would hand over to Morten, please. <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Piotr. So um, regarding the funding period, um, this is partly linked, or this this is linked also to the duration of the the so-called MFF, so the financial uh, the financing periods of the EU budget, um, and and there, uh, if if you look at the the, the very recent uh, calls for proposals, then then they have indeed had a very short implementation period because we are bound by uh, a certain limitation in the duration of the projects at at the end of the period. Um, if, if you take the project from, from the beginning of, of the previous periods, from 14 to 15, then they have had a longer duration. Uh, uh, so uh, so it, it's partly a technical issue linked to the, uh, to the budget and, 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 the, and the time frame of the, um, the availability of the funding and, and, and until the closure of the program. Um, of course, we there is also an, an, a, let's say a discussion in relation to how long should a project be, and and there, uh, when we look to CEF two, um, I see on the one hand this being addressed by the fact that there is now visibility on the core planning, and that meaning that that more mature projects can be submitted, uh, so the projects will be ready to be implemented. Uh, when, when they are submitted for a call for proposal. On, on the other hand, uh, there can also be projects with, with a very long duration where a kind of phasing uh, will be desirable because inherently the projects are subject to delays one way or the other, not only ERTMS projects, but also normal projects. And, 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 theref and therefore, we, um, uh, there is a balance to, to, to find between the let's say, the duration of, of uh, individual projects uh, and possibly facing them. Uh, I hope this, this gives an answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Morten, very much. Uh, there is a set of three questions that, that comes next. The first one on the ATO, the second on the implementing partners, so I believe addressing the blending facility, and the third concerning national implementation plans. Uh, for these questions, I would ask uh, MOVE colleagues to address them. Okay, thanks, Piotr. On the first question on uh, ATO eligibility, um, so, I mean, the eligibility for funding is determined by the work program, um, and that work program is currently being discussed by the CEF committee. Um, for ATO, um, I mean, as I said, the specifications are being developed at the moment. They will be part of the uh, of the next revision, and then um, products on the, the basis of those specifications will be produced. So. Um, to my understanding, the current work program does not mention ATO specifically. Um, from a, a policy perspective, it is something that we would look to support. But in the end, 
um, the eligibility and the the mechanism to, for support would be uh, through the work program, which would mean, need to be discussed and agreed with the member states. So uh, I, I think at the moment, uh, in the current work program, it is not specifically mentioned. Um, in future work programs, uh, potentially it could be, but to be determined. Um, on the next question about the funding through an implementing partner, um, the, the, the current state of play with respect to the, the work program, again, this hasn't been voted, so it's just the current state of play, is that the, the, the CEF support for RTMS is through uh, the grant process, not through a blending process. So assuming that position is, is held in the vote, um, then uh, the, the, the process would not necessarily involve uh, an implementing partner. And on the third question about the national implementation plans, um, so the request and requirement for the, the production of national implementation plans is within the CCSTSI. Um, so it was requested for 2017 on the back of the 2016 revision. Um, there is then a requirement for revision every five years, um, but as that coincides with the new TSI revision, uh, in 2022, uh, we will essentially ask for a, a, a revision with a slightly updated set of information um, in terms of the information requested uh, in the next TSI revision. That said, where we do receive new information uh, or where member states supply it, we do update it on the uh, on, on the Commission website. Thank you, Jan. I see that colleagues already replied to a number of questions, so I would uh, uh, I would let them uh, rest a little bit and would take uh, two next questions. Uh, the first one is on the new vehicles and the question why they are not funded. Actually, the new vehicles are funded. Uh, we call this intervention fitment. And as you might recall in, from Morton's presentation, you saw that we've got already some 390 units that we expect to have fitted by the end of this financial perspective. Uh, all of them were submitted and retained for funding under the blending facility call. So that's for the for this question. And, uh, and the next question is actually for uh, ETCS um, baseline three prototypes and the issue on uh, deliverables, but uh, without the installation of the OBUs on the locomotives. Actually, in this case, uh, mm, uh, we are considering that the action is completed once the uh, vehicle is equipped and is authorized. So uh, the deliverables must be um, assigned to a particular vehicle. The vehicle without uh, OBU installed will not uh, be qualified for receiving the, the funding. I mean, this is the reply provided, I understood uh, correctly the question, maybe there was some another meaning, so uh, you are free to ask another one more detailed if need be. Thank you very much for this. And then for the next one, uh, which uh, addresses the savings uh, by applying the automatic block system, uh, I would ask ERA and DMT colleagues to address. Okay, so um, as, as, as Piotr mentioned before, there will be the answers uh, published afterwards because um, I don't have yet the um, specific applicable uh, data. It is clear that there are savings. Uh, it is clear that this is related with um, uh, increasing performance by the ETCS and the uh, maintenance reductions, but the specific data that was uh, asked in the question, uh, we will check and provide answer to you afterwards. Okay, thank you very much, Silvia. Um, next question about the cost savings on infrastructure uh, is addressed to our MOVE colleagues. Is this the one from... Um... SPB. Sven, yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So, so it's actually not on the infrastructure. It's about uh, the um, uh, the additional maintenance costs of on board. I think. Um, so, I mean, I would say first of all, uh, I don't think uh, additional maintenance costs on board are universal. Probably, on the average, it is correct compared to 
um, what is there at the moment. Certainly, if it's uh, essentially the the onboard uh, being a, a new system where it was purely trackside before, clearly there is um, additional costs. Um, I think a couple of points. First, um, what we have tried to do through um, the revision of the CCSTSI in 2019 is um, put in place uh, a framework that allows the update um, of the onboard for, for example, uh, uh, software changes and uh, small error corrections not to automatically require a reauthorization process. So this is uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, addressing uh, a key part of the uh, of the costs for those changes. That said, um, I mean, what seems to be the case at the moment is even though this system and ETCS on board will require change uh, going forward, um, the arrangements that operators have put in place with suppliers um, tends to be fairly limited in terms of the ability to change. Um, and I think that needs to change in the future. I mean, the fact is that the system will need um, to be updated for error corrections uh, and for, for other changes. That is the nature of this kind of uh, uh, of system. So uh, we try and put in place a, a regulatory level, a process by which um, small changes don't alter automatically trigger reauthorization, uh, but equally um, there need to be actions on uh, on the side of operators to make sure that the the overall setup that is in place is also considering future maintenance changes. In terms of cost impact, I mean, from a CEF perspective, I mean, CEF is largely focused on, you know, first of all, large infrastructure projects, but then also um, facilitating the implementation of large infrastructure projects. So, uh, I mean, I, I think even though technically there could be eligibility for for such maintenance uh, projects, uh, it is not clear to me that CEF is the appropriate instrument um, to do that. So, uh, CEF is there more for the the implementation, uh, the retrofitting and upgrading, rather than ongoing costs. Thank you, Jan. Mm, I see that we also received a question addressed uh, directly to one of the uh, speakers. Uh, Thomas, there is one for you concerning uh, the deployment in the Czech Republic. Would you take this one? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, to the decommissioning of Class B, uh, at first I should uh, explain the situation because about uh, we have about uh, 9,000 kilometers of the lines in the Czech Republic or tracks and uh, 25 percent of them uh, maybe are equipped with ATP Class B. Uh, the first uh, three corridors, which are uh, named in uh, our national implementation plan, uh, which is uh, available on the website of uh, agency, uh, we are planning uh, to start uh, ETCS only operation uh, in 2025. And uh, after this year, uh, we do not uh, do not uh, uh, guarantee uh, the availability of Class B. So uh, since uh, 2025, on these lines, uh, the vehicles should be equipped uh, by ETCS uh, on board because uh, these lines will be ETCS only uh, operation regime. And uh, the rest lines uh, will be step by step. We are uh, currently discussing it uh, with our Ministry of Transport. And we expect uh, about uh, 2030, we will implement uh, ETCS uh, to the other lines. And uh, after the implementation of uh, trackside ETCS, because that's the first implementation of ATP on these lines, uh, the lines uh, should be uh, available only with, uh, uh, or will be, will be uh, maybe uh, operated only with uh, ETCS uh, uh, equipped uh, vehicles. So uh, um, that's uh, our plan today. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, now discussing it with ministry. And uh, I think uh, in summer or in autumn of this year, we should uh, have uh, the uh, years uh, of uh, start of ETCS only operation for uh, all the lines uh, in the Czech Republic. So now I can confirm these three lines as uh, they are mentioned in the implementation plan since 2025. But also 
I should uh, note that a necessary condition for that is uh, the equipment of uh, on of uh, vehicles with on board, and um, I'm I'm afraid that uh, uh, these on boards are now a bottleneck uh, of uh, this project uh, in the Czech Republic. So that's the necessity condition, uh, necessary condition. Uh, if there are no vehicles or not enough vehicles, uh, this project could be uh, seriously, uh, seriously uh, be endangered, in danger. So in uh, case uh, the colleague from France uh, uh, have uh, some question, please uh, write me an email and we can we can discuss it also per email if you if you want more information. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas, very much. Uh, we still are fine with time, so we can address in this session the last three questions that we received. Um, I would hand over all of them to move, notably the one on the white uh, gauge, uh, the one uh, concerning the blending facility and the one on the GSMR network. Yes, um, maybe I can take uh, those uh, three questions. Uh, the first one on the uh, white gauge, uh, so 15, 20 millimeters. Um, so in the past, it was not an issue because the, uh, those three member states that are directly concerned uh, by um, this gauge are the Baltic states. And uh, in the past, they did not have any plans to deploy ERTMS on its uh, network outside the forthcoming uh, Rail Baltica, that it's going to be the standard gauge and by definition with uh, ERTMS. But now we can see that uh, some of those member states, especially Estonia, um, are considering uh, deploying ERTMS on its network. And uh, this is an element that should be taken into um, consideration while discussing the eligibility, because uh, in such a case, uh, we might uh, take into uh, consideration also supporting uh, Estonia in its uh, deployment of ERTMS, at least on the um, core network. Uh, but this is still uh, to come, and uh, we are happy to take uh, those aspects uh, into uh, account. As regards uh, the next question concerning uh, blending facility and uh, the hardships of uh, some smaller uh, operators. E yes, so there, there is uh, the issue of the critical mass. We are in the process of uh, analyzing uh, the merits of the blending facility uh, on the basis of uh, what has happened until present and uh, the, those ongoing uh, projects or those that are supposed to be implementing still in this uh, uh, financing perspective. And uh, we are also discussing it uh, uh, with a view to having a blending facility or not in the next uh, uh, financial perspective for um, ERTMS uh, deployment. Uh, we can see some advantages uh, of having blending facility, uh, like uh, the fact that uh, the projects are uh, accepted, uh, one mature, and also submitted by the um, beneficiaries uh, when they or project promoters when they are uh, also mature and uh, the, the fact that uh, those projects are also screened by uh, um, by banks uh, increase also the the chance that uh, they are possibly more robust than those that are submitted uh, without this screening but uh, as uh, as i said uh, uh, the decision has not been uh, taken yet so that the final decision on the future uh, as regards GSMR, yes, so we are in the transitional period. Uh, we still uh, deploy uh, GSMR also under SEF, but we acknowledge that this is a, a technology with a end of life, possibly 2030, maybe 2035. So some suppliers are indicating that are able to, uh, to provide uh, support uh, over uh, the period of the next uh, 15 years possibly not much longer. So there is also a good question to what extent it makes sense to support uh, deployment of uh, GSMR. However, there are some in some cases it still makes sense. So when we are talking about densification of uh, GSMR network in a given member state, if there are some missing links, it makes definitely sense to, to have it. Uh, uh, we have also to um, take into consideration the, the fact that uh, 
uh, roughly 70%, possibly maybe more, of the hard infrastructure uh, might be reused for FRMCS. So the specifications for the FRMCS are not there yet. And the industrial uh, deployment of FRMCS is foreseen after 2025. So there's uh, this gap period. We can also see that those member states who have not started with the GSMR deployment, like for example, Finland, uh, are waiting for FRMCS and they are not going to uh, deploy uh, GSMR on its network, but they will go directly to FRMCS as, as a sole uh, solution for radio communication. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, very much. Indeed, uh, with this question, we would finish uh, this session of uh, questions and answers. Uh, and seeing that we are mm, very much aligned with the agenda, let's let's keep the, the, the tempo. So I would give the floor now to uh, ERA and uh, DMT colleagues. Please, Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, Piotr. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for, for the sharing uh, from the real projects and also for attending this workshop. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, to share the knowledge and experiences on ERTMS deployment. And I thank INEA for making it possible with this, with this workshop. Well, I'm, I'm Maria Bueno. I, I work for the European Union Agency for Railways. I'm the team leader of the ERTMS track set approval, and I'm also leading the technical support of funded projects uh, with Commission and INEA and with the help of, of the DMT. Uh, the, the agency provides the technical support uh, to Commission from, from very long. And uh, since 2011, this, this process has been more structured first with direct contract in ERA with external support and now uh, directed and coordinated uh, and managed the, by Commission with the help of the DMT and uh, with, the, with the technical lead and support on, on ERA. Uh, this support uh, is even now part of the regulation uh, for this uh, from this full railway packet publication in the regulation you can directly see uh, formal mentions to the ERTMS uh, authority from ERA and also that uh, the agency shall ensure this uh, technical support to the follow-up of, of funded projects. Uh, please uh, can we go to next slide? Thank you. Uh, what ERA does, well, the main aim is really to help beneficiaries to achieve successful projects. This is the, the first thing, and um, the Euro ERTMS funded projects uh, needs to be interoperable. So ERA is clearly trying to ensure that the projects are aligned to, to the EU legislation, that uh, the beneficiary gets uh, full support uh, from experts on the field uh, that are updated with the latest uh, specifications, the technical opinions, the issues from other projects, and uh, that this support gets to them and all deliverables are aligned to the EU legislation and they help to demonstrate that the project has been successfully uh, achieved and is interoperable. So uh, this, uh, this technical support uh, is provided uh, to Digimove and INEA. INEA Digimove uh, decides the, the policy and uh, we help uh, to check that this, all the wording and all the deliverables are aligned to the latest specifications. INEA is managing the projects and INERA we provide uh, technical statements to INEA in order they can decide on payment. And these technical statements are, of course, based on a monitoring of the project from the very beginning and a follow up. And uh, is based on checking the deliverables collected by beneficiaries and uh, also checked by the DMT that uh, help a lot on the process. To, to achieve them on time. Uh, this here, you can see that this uh, collaboration between all entities uh, is very beneficial because 
era is also um, not only now in charge of the year time specifications uh, has the knowledge of what is mandatory for interoperability, but also is with the new task uh, a lot more in contact with real projects, authorizing vehicles, uh, providing safety certificates and uh, approving track site. But also this follow up from the beginning of funded projects gives uh, a real view of all interoperability issues that are happening on projects. There is a lot more synergies between what has to be done to achieve interoperability and to share the knowledge between the projects and the specifications. So, for example, the track set approval is a benefit, has the benefit of getting issues from real projects that were follow up in funded uh, uh, projects, funded, uh, in projects selected for funds. So there is a, a lot of information between real projects and what has to be done and even in between projects. So every new project uh, can benefit of uh, taking care of the issues from the very beginning. I really want to thank you uh, uh, all the beneficiaries for the transparency on uh, the process of the follow-up. Uh, since many years, this collaboration is increasing, the transparency is increasing, we receive more and more information. Uh, in ERA, uh, we monitor this very closely with, uh, with the help of the DMT. We have uh, minimum, uh, I personally meet uh, every two weeks with the team. We get all the information from projects that is very beneficial and I am sure that Internally in ERA, also uh, DMT is updated with the latest technical opinion, chain request discussions, and information from from approvals and other other topics. So it is very important to collaborate from the very beginning. Here in this slide and the following ones, I just wanted to give an idea of uh, the new tasks of ERA, how they are progressing, and. Uh, this also new contact with the uh, real projects. Uh, please, the uh, next slide gives an uh, overview of the number of authorizations issued by ERA. I could not split yet the information from only ETCS project because the OSS is not yet organized in this way to have statistics to split uh, what are vehicles and what are vehicles with ETCS. This might come with the future. And in the next slide, you can have a view of the ongoing uh, track site approval. But I think uh, it's more important that I give the floor to to DMT, to, to INECO, to Sylvia, uh, that could give you more details on, she will go deep on the, on the technical support uh, you can benefit from the very beginning on, on, on projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. And Silvia, you will continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Silvia Dominguez, and I am the uh, technical work stream leader of the ERTMS deployment management team. So ERTMS deployment management team was set up by the commission in 2015 in order to facilitate the RTMS deployment. So in particular for this uh, technical uh, work stream, the commission has tasked us uh, to support from a technical point of view, the beneficiaries of all the RTMS funded projects without additional cost for the beneficiaries of course. Then um, as mentioned before, no, previous slide, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, in the technical uh, work stream, um, we have been working uh, three, since uh, 2015 and we have covered almost all uh, countries within Europe, both for track site and onboard projects. Um, it is important and um, I think it was, uh, thank you Peter for, for mentioning it. I am mentioning this because uh, one of the key characteristics of this technical support is that it is done throughout the complete duration of the project. So 
with this uh, revision of your uh, technical deliverables and the planning and development you have on your projects, we're able to support you so that in the end of the project, uh, you get successful funding. Um, this is key because, of course, identifying any applicable issue at early stages of the project will allow you uh, to cover them or to solve them before the final stages of the project, where we all know that it is most difficult uh, to come up with uh, new solutions or to make any additional changes without creating uh, big, big delays. Of course, with this um, support uh, on the revision of the technical deliverables, it is also possible for us uh, to detect um, open points from a technical point of view. These open points that might lead to interoperability risks or that might lead uh, to some uh, technical blocking points that could um, delay your project. Uh, we are here to support you, so uh, this is what we do for the technical assistance. Next slide, please. So uh, having contact with uh, all the ERTMS funded projects. Uh, next, next slide, I cannot see. Having support and contact to all the ERTMS funded projects uh, allows uh, DMT uh, to have a set of uh, lessons learned from, from the different projects. Um, so we know that each project is different and therefore the technical support necessary uh, is different. And, uh, but in any case, we have learned that most of these lessons learned can be shared in between the different projects and are applicable to help beneficiaries from very different uh, countries and very different projects. Of course, as Maria was mentioning before, uh, it is key to this technical support that we are continuously um, in coordination and in contact with CERA, INEA, and the Commission. With CERA, as we, Maria was mentioning before, this synergy with all the EU latest regulation and um, latest changes uh, that allow us to provide the best support to all the beneficiaries. Our methodology is uh, based on uh, regular uh, meetings with the projects and revision of the documentation. The, of course, this uh, number of meetings and, and, and documentation depends on the stage of the project, depends on the status of the, of the, of the development of the project, but more or less uh, we meet uh, once or twice a year with each project and analyze the technical documentation that is available at those stages. Next slide, please. So I don't see the slight changes. Uh, is it only me or? They do change. Okay. Yeah, you're on the 12th. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, then it's just my, my, my computer. So then, no, then I would go to slide 11, sorry. Because in slide 11, I wanted to go through some of the first advice uh, that we have uh, to the different uh, ERTMS funded projects. So um, as general recommendations, we have these, uh, these three specific recommendations. So first of all, uh, ensure that there is a traceability uh, between the technical deliverables that you will be able to, to provide. So this traceability, of course, um, can be can be done through the ERTMS software and hardware versions, and it's particularly important, uh, for example, in the vehicles projects, since there will be a need to to do this traceability to all the different vehicles, including the the European vehicle number identification. Other of the general um, advices is uh, to um, ensure that you have access to the technical files because they have to be uh, attached to the certificates when they are delivered. And most importantly also, uh, we are aware of the relevance of intermediate statement of verifications at early stages of the project. But intermediate statements of verifications will not be uh, recognized as uh, mandatory technical deliverables to cover the certificates. In the end, 
when you will be submitted the mandatory technical deliverables, only complete certificates will be um, will be accepted. So for all these, um, and as it was mentioned before, it is very important that you engage with the third party assessment from the beginning of the projects. So this includes uh, NOVOs, ASVOs, NSAs, or now of course, uh, ERA as authorizing entity, so that um, you avoid as much as possible any potential delay at the end of the, of the project. Now I go to slide 12. So, here, going a little bit um, into the detail of uh, mandatory technical deliverables, of course, um, these mandatory technical deliverables uh, depend on, on each project, um, mainly on the scope of the project, but also on the legislation uh, it's applicable to it. So always uh, the list of comprehensive mandatory technical deliverables is included in the text of your grant agreement. And now, so now I will go through some of them, not in a comprehensive way, um, but to, to cover some of the most frequently asked questions uh, when giving this, this support to the beneficiaries. So the first type of um, uh, deliverables that are normally available and the ones that are related to testing are for the ERTMS onboard projects, the Success 76 test report um, from an accredited laboratory and the lab and uh, field tests. Um, now, of course, there is also the need to provide these CTCS and radio system compatibility test results, both for ERTMS onboard projects and for uh, the track side project, both for the, the, the results of the test, but also the, the design of these, of these tests. From the track side point of view, the first deliverables are the engineering rules that would be applicable to the line and the operational test scenarios um, results um, that it is important have to be uh, performed with an onboard from a different supplier than the one from the track side. So this is according to also to the CCSTSI. Um, for example, some of the questions that we get uh, for these uh, technical deliverables is related to how uh, mm, can I, as, as, as infrastructure um, representative, ensure that the, the, the onboard with which I am doing the test is interoperable, as it is written in the grant agreement. So here, of course, for these uh, traxic beneficiaries, it's um, flexible normally, so that they can provide the certificate of con constituent of the, of the onboard or the certificate of verification of the onboard system or even the declarations. That the, that the that the that the that are related to them. Um, so the the questions that we get, of course, they are related to these kind of uh, deliverables, but they are also uh, questions we get that that we are able to support you with uh, related to more technical aspects. So, for example, um, can tests be performed with different baselines? Um, here, the answer, of course, uh, differs um, and 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 can be. Um, different for each uh, for each project because of its technical characteristics, um, but in general, um, we are able to uh, point you uh, to the relevant uh, regulation where this can be found, or uh, to the EU uh, guidelines where this can be found, or to provide to you with lessons learned from other projects that have gone through the same kind of scenarios and situations that you as beneficiary of your own project are going through. So next slide, please. So now in slide 13, I'm going to speak about uh, certificates and, and declarations. So um, certificates and declarations are a key in the, um, well, indeed in the authorization of the, of the project, in the authorization of your projects. So also, therefore, they are key in the as mandatory technical deliverables for the, the funded actions. So um, certificates, um, you will need to provide um, the certificates for the interoperability constituents of um, that are applicable in your in your project. Um, they need to accompany by the declaration and also the technical files associated. There is, of course, the need to provide the certificate of verification of the subsystem, including the declaration of verification, the technical file associated, and the safety assessment report. So um, 
Um, these are all uh, deliverables that, of course, are in any case mandatory for authorization of your systems. And therefore, a successful authorization would always also mean a um, successful project. We also have um, these uh, technical deliverables um, that are based on experience, of, of course, of, um, of a lot of previous uh, ERTMS projects. And they are deliverables also included in your grant agreement. And for example, um, they, they, they cover also um, questions that we get a lot in different projects. So for example, are functionalities not implemented acceptable or is it acceptable that the certificate of my project uh, has some restrictions or deviations? So of course, and um, as allowed in the CCS TSI, some type of uh, restrictions um, are allowed and they have to be um, included in the, in the certificates. And since we, it is understood uh, that the, this, uh, this information is, is, it is indeed very important for the beneficiaries and in the end for the use of these systems, uh, this information needs to be complete. Uh, needs to be complete the information of these rest restrictions, but also the effect that these restrictions have on your on your systems. Uh, that is why it is uh, also included as deliverable um, the, the information on restrictions and um, compatibility issues uh, using the the ERA templates that they have available in their website. I am not going to go through all the frequently asked questions um, because some of them uh, we could. Uh, be speaking about them quite a long time and, and they are very technical. Um, we also get, for example, some, some, some questions related to when and how can I apply older SCCS TSI or for constituents or for subsystems. Of course, as before, we can, uh, we can help you to guide you through the regulation because there are already provisions uh, describing these uh, scenarios uh, in the directive or even in the CCS TSI. And um, also, for example, with this um, continuously uh, being aligned with ERA and the ERA guidelines, we can also even um, give you or point you to these EU guidelines that, that will solve your questions, that will solve your unblock uh, these kind of technical uh, difficulties that could impact in the delays or even cancellations of your projects. So next slide, please. So in slide 14, um, we get to the last uh, set of uh, deliverables. This is the, the, the authorizations. Um, so of course, uh, authorization to place on the market for the vehicles and to place in service for the, for the track site. Um, it is, um, it is, Normally, most of the projects uh, reach these authorizations on time before the final claim, uh, but it is also normally allowed uh, when it is the request for this authorization that is the last um, deliverable uh, that you will cover as milestone in, in your projects. Uh, as Maria was mentioning before, uh, here in relation to the, um, uh, to the authorizations, most of the questions we get currently are related to this new uh, the directive and the, this application of the directive to, to the new projects and uh, well uh, related uh, to for example ERA being the, the authorizing entity for uh, international vehicles or even uh, questions regarding the, the ERA um, track site approval. So this is the kind of questions or any questions because I just put here uh, the most frequent ones. Uh, with which we can um, share our, our lessons learned from all the different projects around Europe or try to support you uh, by, um, by this continuous um, contact uh, we have with, with ERA, with the EU legislations and the EU guidelines. So next slide. So I just wanted to thank you for your attention. Um, to thank the beneficiaries uh, that collaborate with us throughout the project, it facilitates our work in order to support you. Um, of course, um, thank Inea for organizing this workshop. Um, I've been in this workshop now, it's I think it's the third time 
and it's always very interesting and it allows us uh, to get to a broader set of, of beneficiaries and to try to answer their questions. And well, my last thing is um, we are here to help you. So my advice is take advantage of it. So that's all from my side. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sylvia. And uh, thank you for your presentation, and and also uh, thank you for for your invitation to to all the projects to to take contact to you and 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 take advantage of of the offer that you are making to them. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, we now have uh, the second and, and last question and answer session, um, and we have uh, three questions at least. So Piotr, I hand over to you for for continuing with that. Thank you. Thank you, Morten. Indeed, we've got three questions, and this time we have these questions also addressed to, to, to the speakers. Um, so maybe I would start with the first, which is addressed initially to uh, uh, Kenny and to Thomas concerning their experience in uh, spinning up of the uh, procedures. I believe uh, this question can also be complemented by uh, ERA as well, because ERA is also, let's say, the, 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 the system authority. So I believe they can also provide uh, a valuable input. So the first, uh, Kenny Thomas, the floor is yours, and then I would ask Maria to step in as well. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good and challenging question, which we pose ourselves every day, how to improve. So it's uh, still a work in progress. But uh, what we try to do, if we think about speeding up, it's uh, standardizing, it's industrializing, and it's reusing what you already have. So I said a lot about the generic file. Uh, it's a kind of blueprint where you show that the solutions you have are functionally okay for your network. And if you prove it once it functionally works, then you reuse it. And so instead of doing a testing in the labo on the functional validation, you, you check the data configuration. So we, uh, we um, invested in a generic file, which is reused on specific projects instead of doing all specific projects in a specific way. So we have a generic uh, uh, production procedure, uh, all processes and plates, and then we can industrialize and reuse what we already have. And uh, the second thing I want to mention, if we talk about uh, the authorization um, stage, yeah, I think here it was already said a lot of times here, it's uh, early involvement of the stakeholders who have to approve. And there we had to find the balance between delivering temporary deliverables and the final ones. It's a, it's a, it's a discussion. Uh, to be done with the stakeholders because the assessors uh, sometimes they just want the final document but then you see if you start reading the document that even the basic principles you have to explain uh, again and again and you lose uh, valuable time in the end of your project so what i suggest is uh, i involve them early agree that you will deliver temporary deliverables if you are time driven yeah, then you should uh, invest in it and also the assessor uh, should invest time in it that in the end uh, you can uh, you can uh, win some time uh, and regarding the practice sharing between the infrastructure managers in that way uh, we uh, as infrabel are part of uh, the ertms users group and there is uh, also a lot of uh, experience uh, exchange uh, between the infra managers so here are a couple of elements uh, i wanted to add. Thank you, Kenny. Thomas, would you like to compliment? Uh, yes, from my side, uh, I uh, cannot confirm that we, we haven't found yet uh, some some uh, ways how to speed up the process because uh, the uh, certification and the assessment of uh, of the system is very very complicated uh, thing and uh, due to a small number of vehicles in the Czech Republic, we are in the testing uh, testing uh, also now. That's why we also uh, need to have some some uh, maybe instruments or some some ways how to how to speed up uh, this this uh, checks and all the whole process of certification. But uh, we haven't found it yet. Also, we uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we would like to have uh, one uh, type of or one baseline. It means baseline three release two for our projects. Uh, for example, from uh, uh, this. Uh, 
it uh, can uh, can simplify for example esc test because we have we will have uh, one uh, battery or one one uh, file of uh, esc test and we will use it for all all the projects it could also uh, simplify the uh, assessment uh, or uh, maybe compatibility test between onboards and uh, track site but uh, uh, the assessment of uh, maybe interconnection or connection uh, of RBCs with uh, interlocking, I uh, I haven't uh, seen uh, some way how to how to simplify it because it's there there are some processes some some standards which we uh, have to fulfill and I, I don't know how to how to how to uh, speed or speed up it. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I would like to give the floor to 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 Era, to Maria, actually, possibly to complement this one, and maybe at the same time to address the the second question, which I already see is is actually in initially thought to be addressed indeed to Era and, and to DMT, which would also cover the uh, uh, coherence between ETCS and existing signaling system. Maria, please. Uh, thank you, Piotr. Um, about uh, this testing and verification checks, I, I encourage in every project to, to involve DMT and to have the specific questions because these are big, big uh, questions that we can go into details and talk forever. But we try at least, we have a list of open things and open points and things that were problematic in some projects. So you will always have to DMT asking you if you are covering those things. So you will anticipate any problems. So we ensure you have at least two on board to test to have the certificates, etc. So it's difficult to enter into into details about uh, the coherence between the signaling, uh, the coherence between the lateral signaling and the ERTMS. Again, this is a question that is very very open. I mean, uh, the first suggestion is linked to the questions we had about the the cost uh, you save if you get rid of the lateral signal. I imagine in this case you cannot, but of course if you have level two, uh, you might get rid of the lateral signal, so the problem solve. If not, of course, there are many technical solutions. There are packets if you are level one, if V main, there are operational rules also, uh, because you have to take care and consider that ERTMS is cap signaling, so maybe you don't need to take care at, at all of the of this inconsistency. There are, there are many, many solutions. What I suggest is that you come to us with a specific problem, so we see what is the real inconsistency you are uh, you concerned about, and then we can give better, better specific support to that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I see the last question is initially addressed to Peter, but uh, DMT is also mentioned in the question. So I think that uh, uh, we may start with Peter intervention here and then with uh, Sylvia compliments uh, to this question. Peter, please take the floor. Yes, indeed. So um, the question about uh, practical benefits of, of involving DMT uh, early in the, in the process I think uh, Silvia just explained it uh, in details also before, but from our point of view, um, it is basically a, a help to to avoid or to, to understand what we really need to deliver. Um, you might see it on paper, but in practice what we experience is that, especially for, let's say, external documents you get from, from testing, test reports, noble certificates or table certificates, the external party might believe this is complete and this is what we need or you should submit to to the um, subsidy application but uh, it might turn out that you're missing a couple of lines here or there's a restriction there which you didn't identify because we are also we are not the expert in that sense so showing this up front and discussing understanding what really needs to be on paper with the dmt uh, who has experience in, in more projects is was key for us was clearly clearly help um, to avoid that we run into, into critical deadlines here. Um, also on the tendering phase, yes, I, I can only believe and I can only recommend this to, to, to at least engage with INECO uh, initially or INEA to see what kind of support they can give during the tendering procedure. 
um, again, this can only help to um, to smoothen the uh, the project as such. Thank you, Peter. Sylvia, would you like to uh, complement this? I think Peter answered uh, in a very complete uh, view, and I and I thank uh, to share his experience as beneficiary because um, indeed, um, so we are we are here to, to help you uh, achieve successful funding. So uh, the idea is that instead of getting our comments in the end of your project, you will be able to get them at earlier stages. Uh, even with, um, I think it was Penny mentioning it, even uh, when they are uh, draft documents or uh, trying to understand the scope, uh, DMT is there to support you and to to, to ensure uh, that in the end you will not get uh, negative comments. So um, yes, um, I, I think nothing else to complement to Peter's uh, response. Thank you, thank you very much, Sylvia, and thank you also to Peter for answering this uh, this last question of uh, of today. Um, I will now try to. To wrap up uh, a little bit on on, on the event uh, uh, before we we close it, um, first of all, we touched a couple of times on on uh, the CEF funding on the CEF two and, and and what are the uh, let's say what uh, how does it look like what are the opportunities so so indeed it has been said that the um, uh, the ERTMS is. Uh, certainly a priority also in, in, in CEF2 uh, and uh, as, as Ian also mentioned there are discussions ongoing on, on the first work program for CEF2. Um, this is of course subject to, to the final approval of the CEF2 uh, regulation uh, but in parallel the work is going on on, 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 the, on the work program and, and as it was also mentioned uh, then in, indeed for the moment the, the initial proposal is that um, ERTMS will be included in the work program with, with classical uh, uh, calls for, uh, for, for funding. Um, with regard to the timetable then, uh, as I said, it depends on the adoption of the CEF2 regulation, but the current planning is that uh, the, the first call on the CEF2 should be published uh, before the summer this year with a deadline in, in the autumn this year. Uh, and then, uh, as it uh, was also said, the, the, it is not only a planning for this year, but there is a, a, a stable planning for the next three years and an indicative planning also for on, until the end of the program. So this gives much more visibility to you as potential applicants for CEF funding uh, for your TMS. Uh, 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 the, opp the opportunity to actually better plan when should you prepare your proposals uh, for, for which call and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is a little bit an indication of, of when will be the first opportunity. Um, having listened to, to the discussions of, of today, um, uh, I think it has been, been very interesting to receive the, the input from uh, uh, from both from DG Move, uh, from from the, the experience from the projects, and also from Era and DMT, on on how they are supporting the the whole process, and and I would of course like to thank them very much for their interventions. I would also like to thank uh, thank you, the participants, for the questions that you have asked. I hope that that uh, we have been able to give you uh, good answers, and as mentioned, we will also come come back with uh, replies. Uh, Let's say the replies will be uh, provided via the website also after the event. Having listened to, to the discussions, and, and we've also heard about a lot of problems that, 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 that have been uh, faced by, by the projects, and also from, from INEA, from our experience with managing these projects. Um, but I also hear that, that many of these project problems have been tackled or are in the process of being tackled. And, and I think that gives us, uh, let's say, uh, a positive view to the future because it means that, that many of these problems will, will be overcome, are being overcome uh, already now. So it, it, it gives us hope that, that it will be easier to, to implement uh, the ERTMS projects in the future. 
I'm saying easier because I don't think it will ever be easy to implement an ERTMS project or infrastructure projects for that sake. But but there there are many things that can can be done, and and, and it seems that we are on a good track to to actually speed up the implementation of ERTMS. Uh, so so that sounds uh, very good to me, and that's very positive. And I think an, an additional push. In, in that direction is indeed, let's say, this increased uh, visibility of the, the future funding opportunities under the Connecting Europe facility, and where I hope that this will also lead to the, the submission of, of more mature applications at, in, exactly at the time when, when the funding is needed for these projects to, to get started. I also hear the, the importance of, um, let's say, the collaboration between the different actors, actors. So this is both the collaboration between uh, the project promoters and the authorities, but also the collaboration with ERA and with DMT, and and, and of course also the, the the collaboration with with us. Uh, and and I think that it is a key word, this uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, and 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 I think that will give a further push to the implementation of of ERTMS. Uh, so as mentioned, the uh, the presentations will become available on on our website uh, together with the the questions and and the answers. Um, in addition to having thanked the uh, the speakers at the event, I would also like to thank uh, the colleagues in INEA who have organised this event, uh, in particular Piotr and, and Francesco, but but there are several colleagues behind them also having contributed to the to the preparation. And then I would also like to thank the participants for, for being there, for sharing uh, uh, their, their questions. Um, I'm sure that there, there can be more questions. And, and if you have uh, questions, then I would invite you to contact also your, your engineer project manager to address these questions. And, and we can even possibly take them on board uh, as additional information to the, to the answers uh, that have been, been given here. And, and, and any advice that, that you may have uh, to increase the, let's say, the, the successful implementation of, of projects is, is very much um, uh, appreciated. Because as I said, I think only through collaboration and sharing of, of experience and knowledge, we, we, we can achieve this um, in, in, in a timely manner. Um, at, at, um, now at, at the end of the event, of course, usually we would have invited you, uh, the participants, for a lunch and there would have been the opportunity for networking. Unfortunately, given the circumstances, this, this is not possible. But I hope you will reach out to, to each other anyway and we are happy to help with that also so that we can uh, we can do, let's say, uh, an, an, a virtual networking maybe even. Um, the last point from my side uh, would be uh, that there is a feedback form available in Slido, which I would invite you to uh, to respond to, so that you can um, uh, so that we can also improve similar events in in the future. So please take a couple of minutes to to fill it in. Thank you very much, and thank you for your participation, and have a nice lunch. <laughs>